Hello. Today is uh, December 30th, uh, Saturday, episode 67 of Block Digest. Uh, block height 501,789. And uh, to not forget this today, introducing out of our regular cast, Mr. Rick. Hey, everyone. How are y'all doing? Got JW and his nice uh, Stormtrooper mask today. Hey, ladies. How's it going? Miss Janine. Hello. Guten Tag. And Mr. Acknix. Hey, what's up, guys? Alrighty then. So let's uh, let's let's go through the the nice Christmas stuff. We're we're a few days late on. Had a nice uh, Segwit uh, use percentage pump that uh, sadly a little bit after Christmas petered back down. I, I, I hate these moments where we, we see that big spike, people moving cold storage, and then it just goes back down and it's like, ah. And then um, just another uh, another shill for Magical Crypto Friends. Uh, hopefully should have uh, another episode coming out sometime soon. You guys should uh, definitely check this out. But I guess something uh, a little more immediately relevant to go through. Uh, Rodolfo Novak from uh, CoinKite. Pretty awesome list of all the big events um, of this year. I think this is a pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive. Everybody remembers the UASF shit show. The whole 2X, ASIC boost, lightning, the whole Jim, or Damone scandal. You know, it's set himself up to be the, the one bank <laughs> that's kind of sitting there uh, out of the shit show as everybody else is scrambling into Bitcoin. It's been a crazy year, man, hasn't it? Jeez, like all time high, 20,000, like all this, you know, this, I mean, just mainstream adoption, really, it feels like this year, but I mean, I imagine next year's going to be even crazier. Mm -hmm. and I mean, like he had to like this, this is like really comprehensive list. I had to go on like three tweets. Got the uh, the Blockstream satellite launched earlier this year, which is I still think something not a lot of people really appreciate the importance of. Geek Dragons Den conspiracy theories, you know, at his um his transformation into a, a ragged bearded cypherpunk, which was actually pretty uh pretty nice to see guys in the ecosystem just kind of making that shift from cypherpunk to suits it's glad to see one going the opposite way yeah uh, yeah i mean just don't want to go over each and every one of them you guys can obviously check out the tweet but you know it's it's kind of nice to put all this stuff into perspective like you know i, I feel like everybody just gets caught in the add news cycle because of how fast things happen in this ecosystem but a lot of shit that happened this year and it's not all just you know fud or more drama on the social medias i'd, I'd see the ripple versus ethereum flipping in there yeah that's that that okay oh, no. we gotta correct we, we we gotta we gotta add this right now <laughs> <laughs> Ripple, Ethereum flipping. Check. I think Twitter wants me to spell Ethereum with an I. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I kind of moved past the meandering list though. Uh, one nice thing, we, we kind of ended the last show on a little bit of a downer note with uh, the news that Ross's family, as well as everybody else trying to visit uh, inmates at the prison, wouldn't be allowed to see them for the holidays. But uh, a little bit after we got off the air, apparently everybody was actually allowed to go and see their family. You know, Ross didn't have to spend the holidays alone by himself, which is, uh, I think, a pretty nice turn of events. Uh, it's not something I can even begin to imagine. No, that's really cool. I mean, like, you know, whenever the government comes hard down hard on someone, you know, you really start to see like how ruthless our government can be and to see them like, you know, even just give a little bit, it's always good, you know, especially the holidays. Like I know his family was excited to see him. That's fantastic. 
Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, if uh, you want to take over uh, lead on this, Janine, it's actually uh, another little bit of optimism potentially in Ross's future. Um, they're actually taking the uh, the appeal all the way to the Supreme Court at this point. And I yeah, think so yeah, so uh, if you've been following, um, before we get into um, his Supreme Court appeal or possible su Supreme Court appeal. Um, if you've been following any of the cases, like uh, cybersecurity stuff um, that's been going to the Supreme Court uh, in the last year or so, there was a really important case that I was following called Carpenter versus United States. Uh, and it's uh, pretty, I don't remember the specifics of uh, the actual case. I think it's something to do with um, uh, he was uh, doing, he was selling drugs or something and the um, the cell phone uh, location data from his phone was used to track him when he was doing the deal. Uh, anyway, I'm probably going to get that completely wrong because I haven't looked at the specific case in a while. But basically, Carpenter versus United States is a Fourth Amendment case that's, I think, still being argued in the Supreme Court. And it's about uh, whether the police can access your phone's location data without a warrant. And the government argues that it should um, be entitled to that kind of information because... 95% of American adults who own cell phones choose to give up that information. Um, that's that's their argument, and I think that's pretty questionable because uh, if uh, I can probably send you the tweet, Shinobi, but um, there was some uh, usability studies that I was looking at um, several months ago, and one of them it was quite amazing to learn about you know what what the public perception is of how uh, mobile devices work and one of the things that apparently a lot of people believe if you extend the percentages that were study um, a large portion of people like maybe people think that SMS and voice calling via mobile are the most secure messaging services <laughs> now most of us here probably know that's not true as um, anyone who has had their uh, phone sim swapped or something like that in the last year or so related to cryptocurrency would very well know um, but that's definitely an illuminating perspective when it comes to this case because it shows you that a lot of people don't actually know how their phones work and so um, in addition to people thinking that SMS is secure, a lot of people think that there is no provider in 3G networks, only a sender and recipient. So they actually think that uh, mobile devices are a P, which I guess is a plus in a way if you know, you're know you um, thinking of marketing a new peer-to-peer uh, -peer product, but <laughs> the current reality is that is not the case. Um, so yeah, the reason I wanted to bring up that case is because um, uh, that's actually going to be important in Ross Ulbricht's appeal because uh, I guess his lawyers are going to argue that some of the uh, surveillance that was done on him prior to his arrest um, could actually invalidate um, a lot of the evidence that was presented as trial because they would say that it's a violation of his Fourth Amendment rights because it would be considered as a warrantless search. And of course, they, when they were doing all of the surveillance, they didn't have any warrants for any of that activity as far as I'm aware. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting that, you know, a relatively standard uh, privacy case um, might be really important into uh, getting Ross Ulbricht uh, at least a shorter sentence, if not um, uh, completely cleared in terms of sentences or charges. Yeah, I was actually uh, just, re I, that's like fantastic news. I hope that the appeal goes through honestly. And I really think that it should just because as an American and, you know, I see that you know, our rights are kind of just being trampled over as far as like surveillance and stuff like that. And I was actually reading a tweet um, from Glenn Greenwald that was talking about how Facebook was deleting accounts on, you know, whether or not the U.S. government or Israel wanted them to. And they were talking about the importance of decentralized systems in this time, because I mean, like that, that all sort of did come out with the Snowden revelations. Like, I, I feel like a lot of people I don't. You know, as someone like myself, when I saw the Snowden revelations, I really freaked out. I was really pissed about it, seeing like the wholesale sort of flip between Silicon Valley and the intelligence community, just sort of sucking it all up. Like it's, we'll figure the laws out later. And that was really aggravating for me. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why I'm in Bitcoin. There's, there's definitely some power to this decentralized system. 
that we're working on right now. And, um, you know, that's, uh, yeah, hopefully this, this gets an appeal because, you know, as an American that does get his data sucked up with all these others, I really find it aggravating. Yeah, totally. I think, uh, I don't think there's any question that we're getting all our data sucked up these days. Um, there doesn't, as far as I can tell, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of pushback on that, but, um, but maybe there's hope that if our data does get sucked up, there's some limits on how they can use it. Um, you know, obviously they're going to, they're going to probably push those limits regularly, but it would be nice to see somebody like Ross, uh, get free for sure. And it would set a really nice precedent, um, and limit at least how blatant they can be about it. Um, which, which would be nice. I'm usually not too optimistic about stuff like this. I mean, it doesn't sound like we know if the Supreme Court's actually going to hear the case and they don't hear most cases. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of, you know, reasons to be pessimistic about it. But, um, but then again, you know, in the nineties and the crypto wars, all all that stuff went in a direction that I think a lot of the cynics didn't expect it to go, um, with actually legalizing cryptography that was ammunition until then, because they couldn't, you know, draw a good line between cryptography and speech. So every once in a while, things, you know, go a whole lot more rational and logical than uh, somebody like me expects. So hopefully that'll happen here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, it's uh, aside from just like the the Fourth Amendment uh, aspects of this, you know, it's just like completely sweeping aside the context of Ross. Like that is a huge debate that just is barreling forward under its own momentum. Like that is like in the, the way in which like the, the legal system is just kind of applied to 20th and 21st century technology. It's like, it just does not even attempt to kind of reconcile the, the analogs between like how things used to work and how they work now in a digital age. And it's, it's like there, it's this, this big sweeping attempt to kind of just brush the entire constitution off the table under like that that nitpicky semantical argument that like no this this is different because it's digital so none of this stuff applies and like you also have like the the entire like sixth amendment aspect like your right to a a trial by a jury of your peers and and the way that that was managed through ross's entire trial is, is ridiculous like they they completely manipulated how the jury was viewing the entire situation and then pulled specific evidence and charges against Ross, refused to let Ross actually produce or like go over specific pieces of evidence to, to his own benefit. Like they, they completely undermined the entire process of just providing the information to a jury and letting the jury judge him with the full picture and the, the full argument from both sides. And it's like in, in both ways, like they just completely, in my view, threw his constitutional rights in the toilet. And it's like, you know, I would love to see this turn out good for Ross and actually like, you know, get him out of prison. But, you know, Ross aside, this is this is a much bigger fight than, than just, you know, his unjust sentencing. Like the, this is just the, the kind of way the entire system is shifting in the digital age to just try to undermine like the, the rules by which it has to interact with us and, and pretty much just turn it into something that is completely and utterly arbitrary based on whoever is in that position of power and what they want to do. And like that fight is not going to stop. Like we are going to continue fighting that. Yeah. I mean, like, I think it's, you know, it'd be great if Ross could get, you know, freed, like that would be awesome. But like that fight is a long one. And I think really like they should just hear the appeal based on like that, you know, like if they want to uphold this, like we are the Supreme Court, we make the, you know, like at least give the man a fair trial. Like let's hear a real trial and let's talk about what happened and let's discuss the legalities of it. But, you know, that, uh, that just, you know, jumping in and, um, you know, saying we're going to listen to this and that and not this and that because, you know, it's our choice and, you know, that's all there is to it. Like, uh, it just doesn't sound very just at all. And especially for some Supreme Court. No. Yeah, the, the thing that, I mean, it was all, it was all a farce, but the thing that I always think of that's most disturbing is that 
you know, the judge was really clear that she was punishing him not because he tried to kill people or because he facilitated drug sales, but because he had really crazy ideas because his ideas were so dangerous that, you know, he needed to spend the next 20 years in prison. And those crazy ideals boil down to like abolitionism, right? Like he doesn't think that somebody should be able to steal somebody else's stuff just because they have a funny hat. But that idea is so dangerous that they would rather put him in prison for a long time unjustly. So, I mean, the, the whole system is really, really bad and it's really, really corrupt. And uh, I, you know, I don't think that we should look at the Supreme Court as anything less political than Congress or whatever den of vipers are, you know, trying to make deals and um, benefit themselves individually at the expense of other people. But, but sometimes it goes well. So um, I'm still holding that a little bit of hope for him in the long run, though. I mean, I don't think he'll be there for the next 20 years. Uh, not if, not if uh, you know, people start becoming individually empowered at the rate they did this last year. I mean, if we have another, if we have a 2018 that looks like 2017, it's going to get real interesting. Yeah, and I also want to quickly point out that it wasn't, on, they're not, not only um, arguing for, they argue on uh, sixth if you're not um, an American, uh, Sixth Amendment deals with um, how criminal, um, and so they're going to argue that because of all the corruption um, that was involved in the trial, because of the the way the investigation agents who ended up, you know, stealing Bitcoin, and uh, there's even suspicion that one of them was uh, to act as one of the um, Robert's accounts uh, on the Silk Road itself, uh, they want to, so they want to argue that there was corruption in the investigation, and therefore that, that did the fact-finding um, uh, process in the case, and that would be a Sixth Amendment violation, um, which I actually think that there's a stronger chance that that, that that would turn the tables, because you know, they. I mean, we are. Everyone already knows at this point that there's warrantless surveillance, and no one's go, no one's going to jail for that. Like we've seen that over the past several years, even when it's so blatantly obvious that I don't think that's going to affect much. But I do think that, considering how public and embarrassing that corruption was, I think that would be grounds to give him a lighter sentence because that's out in the open, and like, no, maybe, maybe. You know, most people don't care about warrantless surveillance, but I'm sure people care about uh, corruption by um, investigators. So I think that in that that's probably their strongest argument. I mean, like that that guy's in jail, right? And I mean, like he are, like that uh, was a DEA agent that uh, he got sentenced, and then they even FBI. upped it. Yeah, they yeah FBI. Okay, and then they like raised it up even more. They were like, no, you're not getting out. This is this is uh, corrupt. I mean, like he's already in. So um, that should be a slam dunk, right? I mean, it, it seems like it should be, but yeah, like JW saying, this is political whims. It's not really, you know, a fair, like balanced, uh, you know, blindfolded lady of justice. Yeah, but I mean, that's kind of like, you know, why I think this is important, like to, to not just like go, oh, well, like we lost. I, I mean, you know, like I've said a few times lately, even in the most ideal voluntarist slash anarchist world, like there are going to be some form of government. Like they'll be more voluntary. They'll be more subject to the whims of the, the market and actually have to compete to exist. But like that, that kind of thing, it's, it's not going away. Like you need some kind of social structure for larger scale social interactions. It's just a matter of how coercive it is. And I think everyone here would agree that it should be like not coercive. It should be, if, if possible, as entirely voluntary as you can make it. But you know that I, I don't think that necessarily precludes trying to improve the kinds of systems we have now or, or work within them to try to make these systems like function like that if possible. And like did fundamentally like what's going on here is like any system like that you need to have like the rules like the rules set up that everybody agrees to that they operate within and are bound by 
And that's how like a, a large scale like social construction works. And what's going on here in the US right now is they're trying to use this to shift into the digital age as a way to just completely like get rid of those rules, but still maintain that coercive position of power. And like I I, I don't think it's entirely a lost cause to try to reform that or stop that or roll that back. I mean it's you know, I, I'm not the most optimistic about like it, things working out that way, but I don't necessarily think that people should just throw their hands up and stop trying. Because I mean, if, if you boil down to the constitution, like as far as the United States is concerned, I agree with that. Like that, that is something in, in the perfect anarchist world. If you just throw all governments out the window, being honest with myself, I would probably go shopping around for the one that most closely resembles like the US Constitution as its foundation. And it's it's like it shouldn't be just break everything to try to build something new. It should be like what pieces do we have that are still usable and how can we use them? Because like breaking the, the game board, so to say, it yeah, you you'll wind up being able to start from a fresh page completely, but like that that's not an, an entirely positive thing. Like that comes with its own downsides, and like pe people shouldn't just kind of boil things down into that black and white, like good bad, like useful not useful. Like the, everything is shades of gray and nuances to actually pick through in, in individual situations. Yeah, I, I mean. I, I'm definitely an extreme sort of anarchist, right? Like, I, I wouldn't say it's really all that extreme, but but that's how people would categorize me if I if I explained what I believe. And uh, but even even guys like me believe that there there will be there will always be a need for a legal system. Uh, we just think it will probably more resemble the common law system, um, where where judges um, try to uncover the law. In other words, they're they're trying to figure out what are the social norms what are the expectations of private property you know who's actually committed a crime against whom and then looking for restitution right our current legal system resembles that so little that it's it's completely laughable um but that doesn't mean that as a strategy it doesn't make sense to try to stay out of jail um if you can or try to get innocent people out of jail i'm not i'm not super optimistic right like i I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't drop what I'm trying to do on Bitcoin to try to learn enough about the law to help in an appeal, right? I, I don't think that that would be a good use of time for, for most people. And if somebody was saying, hey, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm a young person and I'm looking for a way to contribute to the world, I would say learn how to write code, right? Don't, don't learn how to file appeals in corrupt legal systems. But, you know, that's just a matter of strategy at the end of the day. You know, people like Ross should not be in a cage with a bunch of psychopaths because they built a website. And uh, how we accomplish that, I think, is uh, it's just a matter of strategy. Yeah. I just want to clarify really quick. Um, so we were having a bit of debate in the chat box of where uh, the two agents, uh, Sean Bridges and uh, Sean Bridges and Carl Force, I believe. Carl, so Carl force one of the agents was from the de dea sean bridges was from the secret service but then i also want to quote a word article that kind of gives their background a bit because it, there's so many um he's playing uh cops and robbers in this thing that i'm actually confused about which ones they belong to uh so uh, this is a quote from Wired. Bridges and Fork Force of investigators based in Baltimore, not the team led by the New York office of the FBI, which also included agents from IRS and the DHS. Neither Force nor Bridges testified at Albrecht's trial, and it seemed at times that the New York office had carefully quarantined itself from the Baltimore task force's corruption. Uh, so yeah, that's how many agencies do you have? DEA, Secret Service, IRS, DHS. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of people and you still messed it up um <laughs> uh yeah so they were involved in a lot and i also want to i also think um because i was reading another article and i want to remind everyone that um ross is currently being held in a maximum security prison like that just seems insane to me so 
um, let's say there, like, there's a ton of options. He could get completely clear, set free, you know, as soon as the, um, uh, if the appeal is, uh, also remember that in order for the appeal to actually happen, um, four of the justices actually have to accept to hear it first. And it, I don't think that's happened yet. So we don't even know if it's going to get heard yet. But let's assume that they accept it and the case gets heard. I to be more lenient uh, with him. He has several options. He could be, you know, released from prison and um, he could get his sentence shortened. He'd get kind of, he wouldn't be given a pardon, but he would have just have a more lenient sentence, kind of like how, what Chelsea Manning had um, at the beginning of this year, um, which would be nice, uh, but obviously uh, clearing him of um, all charges would be best. And then I suppose they could also move him to um, a lower security prison so that he could, I don't know, go outside and enjoy a bit more freedom, even if he's in a cage. Um, but I definitely would prefer that he gets his sentence either shortened or dropped entirely. But no, the, those emaciated computer nerds that, that stare at stare at bright screens all day, the, the risk is too high that they're going to, you know, put together some special forces level prison break. He, he's got to be in max security. It's just not safe otherwise. Well, yeah, speaking of emaciated um, computer nerds, you know, Wired, I really don't appreciate that every time you write a story about Ross Ulbricht that you make him look like this evil, I don't know if we want to, I'll send it to you guys so you can see it, but I don't know if we should show it. But seriously, Wired, you have the worst artists. I don't know if that's a general thing or if you just pick the worst artists for stories about Ross Ulbricht, but every time I see pictures of a really terrible drawing or uh, like some, some kind of image, like, can you just pick a photo of his actual face where he's smiling? Because if you look at photos of his face, I mean, he looks like a very pleasant person. He doesn't look cringing, menacing, green something or other, as you see in this picture. Like, seriously, guys, you have to... Like, this is really disgusting how you treated him. Yeah, that picture is ridiculous. Like, that looks like he's, like, high on some future drug or something, just spitting out like a complete degenerate. Like, that. that's not framing things artificially at all slash s is there evidence that ross never washes his hair because i'm i'm not i don't remember hearing that i thought he had some really cool looking hair man yeah it looks pretty uh yeah pretty raggly in that picture but i think uh you know we had we did see a positive sign with uh chelsea manning lately and that's something that you mentioned or like you know maybe there is some hope you know, because like that was one where for sure, like for the longest time, everybody's saying they're, they're never going to let that guy go because, you know, so obviously like just sucking up information and releasing it and, you know, to what would be called enemies of the state. And, you know, he's walking, he's free right now. So, I mean, like, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, something, some surprise could happen. And yeah, maybe Ross can't get out of there, but like at the very least, like you're saying, it would be nice just to get him his sentence reduced and, or like just to a lower security prison to where he could get out, do some stuff with his family, maybe. But um, I mean, just just give him a chance to for them to go over stuff again. Just just appeal it, go over everything again, like tear it apart, allow more discovery, allow some of the stuff that was covered before to be uncovered, and like have a real discussion about it. Because I, I don't think that the discussion that need to be had was had there at, at that courthouse. Definitely not. Yeah, my. My uh, my favorite quote, uh, I believe that Andreas Antonopoulos was actually brought in to testify and he was determined to not have enough expertise on the subject of Bitcoin. I think he was specifically brought in to challenge, uh, there was an FBI to trace all of the Bitcoin backs computer. <laughs> You're like, oh, we would like to see evidence of that. How exactly did you do that, buddy? Um, and so they brought Andreas in and he was, I think they said he didn't have enough expertise or something. He wasn't qualified by subject. And so, okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the list 
of uh, absurd injustices is like at least 25 long. I could probably just rattle off of the top of my head, let alone somebody that's actually studied the case. It, it's just like one absolute, you know, piece of nonsense after another. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, the other like part of it is like, we don't really hear much about like what he's dealing with, like actually in, in the prison. And I mean, if you, if you draw like a comparison to Chelsea Manning, like he, he was harassed constantly. Like they, they were literally trying to drive him to kill himself when, when he was actually in prison. And like it, I just, like, it's fucked up to think about, but I just can't imagine that, that nothing like that is going on in Ross's case. I mean, that like that that's what they do in these kinds of situations where you pretty much make a political example of people. They, they don't, it's not just like you're in the cage, we're leaving you alone. Like they continue fucking with them. Well, it's not only that. Like, uh, I, I don't think they want Ross to spread the information that he could potentially spread. Like, I, I think this, this has to do with, you better keep your mouth shut, too. And you better realize that we're the ultimate authority and power here. And uh, you, you better not, you know, you better not fuck up because we'll kill you. And that, that's what it seems like this is about. Like, it, it seems bigger than, than whatever they painted on the news and the media, to me at least. Yeah, I mean, it definitely felt that way whenever, like, the judge was, like, saying, like, hey, this is more than about what we're talking about here. This is, like, we're going to punish you and we're going to make an example out of you. And um, that's what they're trying yeah. to do, you know. it's. But I, I don't necessarily think they're, they're, you know, they're examining the environment and the situation well enough to, to be making the right calls here. Like, I think there's, you know, that they, they're trying to make this a quick case and, and trying to be very judgmental. And it's like, uh, maybe this required more exploration. Maybe there shouldn't be any kind of quick, like, jump to judge here. And I think that's what happened here. Like, everyone moved too quickly, and there was a lot more to discuss. And it was under the the fear, under the guise that that there's some kind of, like, uh, you know, like, uh, kind of taboo thing going on here. And I, I don't really think that that's a, the scenario. I don't really think it's uh, made out to be as it is. I don't know, man. I, I think it went exactly as I would expect it to go. I mean, there was a lot of political motivation to do something about this. Um, you have a website that is making it really clear that drugs are not as dangerous as the DEA and all of the agencies that get a ton of federal money want you to think that they are. Um, you know, the, the, the reality that the market was providing um, safer and purer drugs when it was left unhindered and uh and that that was actually less damaging both to users and to sellers and that it was a violence-free environment i mean man that was just like that was a that was you know more violent against the the empire and its system of systematically extracting wealth from innocent people and redistributing it from to the political class right with this veneer of we're doing it to take care of you than anything else right um so it doesn't really surprise me that they've treated him like timothy mcveigh right because as far as challenging their power <laughs> like he 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 did that he didn't do it violently but he did it more effectively um and, yeah that's why they're scared of it i think is because like we've figured out hey you can do that without blowing up a building without killing people like like we can shirk this kind of imposition of force and authority without sinking to that same level of violence. And I think like that well, well, fundamentally is what terrifies them. Well, not only that, they weren't claiming, like Silk Road wasn't claiming that this stuff was safer or anything like that. They actually had uh, harm reduction sites up and they had subreddits and forums dedicated to saying that this stuff is extraordinarily harmful. And we don't suggest that you try it, but if you must, like here's what you should look out for. And, like, that's the way I saw, like, a lot of these forums, like, approach this stuff. So, I, I mean, maybe that's also part of what scared them. Yeah, it wasn't that Silk Road was saying it was safe or that Ross was saying it was safe or endorsing it. It was that it was becoming really, really clear that legalizing drugs um, would actually result in all of the things that the government claims to want to accomplish in keeping drugs illegal, right? You would have less addiction. You'd have less... Um, you'd have less overdoses and deaths. 
the the violence that comes from drug sales and you know controlling neighborhoods all that stuff would go away right so it's a really powerful narrative against a massively well-funded machine and uh you can't do that stuff um without yeah it's a it's a undermining of the narrative if you will right well i mean like let's look at what it did i mean like silk road was in 2011 and i think it was two years later we saw legalization of recreational marijuana and i mean like an actual like uh you know starting to treat cannabis as a medicine and um you know maybe ross is like a little bit of of a martyr on that i mean i would say he's a a real martyr on that front i mean because uh if anything it did kind of just like show like everybody like in the face like look you know you're worried about pot but look at all this and like look how easy it is for you know someone to just like build a whole system and construct it and you know now we can have all this go on right now in front of you and what are you going to do about it like that's it really was like that sort of scenario what are you going to do about this because i built it it's here people can buy it and like i mean it's a it's really like a a a trial i would like to see happen where they actually you know judge this thing accordingly but I, i don't know if we'll ever see that but um like i do think like you know like what he did has had an effect already and um hopefully it'll continue on yeah, and I think one of there's like two things that people forget often about the Silk Road. One, drugs were not the only thing that was being sold there. Like people were selling everyday things that you can find on Amazon as well. They were selling stuff like, and I think the classic example is um, unpasteurized milk or something. And second, the drugs that were being sold, not all of them were, you know, things like heroin and marijuana. Some of it, or a lot, I would guess a lot of it, I've never actually looked into the statistics of what kinds of drugs were being sold, but I know that a significant amount of it was things like ins- like off-brand insulin. And it's, and it's like, this is all standard yep. stuff, and the reason why people were using the Silk Road is because it was a whole lot cheaper and stuff. Um, you know, because the markup price on the branded stuff, like EpiPens especially, it's like huge. And like people go bankrupt, like buying the prescriptions for these, all the insulin and EpiPens and things like that. So it's like a lot of people were kept alive because the Silk Road existed because they could buy very basic and necessary drugs that had nothing to do with addiction or, you know, it was stuff to just keep them alive. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've completely, it would probably take me weeks to dig up the link. Uh, but like I remember like years ago reading something on Reddit where like somebody literally their life was saved because they bought antibiotics on Silk Road when, when they had a serious infection, when they otherwise couldn't have afforded to get their hands on it. Like it, it was, yeah, exactly. It, it was not just drug addicts getting high. It, it was a marketplace to actually let the market be the thing setting the price and not these price gouging monopolies. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was the most dangerous thing you could do. It was proof that anarchism would work, right? It was proof that the market is effective at providing things like food and medicine and, you know, all the things that supposedly we need uh, an oppressive um, king to rule over us in order for us to have access to. That's, that's, it was a hell of a political statement. Mm-hmm. Ah, but yeah, I think we've kind of plumbed this. Uh, there's a couple of little interesting uh, Twitter conversations that were going on, though, uh, <laughs> while we were off air. Uh, th- this one, I think, is a... Uh, whatchamacallit? All right, brain fart. Yeah, pr- pretty much Jonas here is just kind of like trying to like make the argument, you know, like, we don't like paying these high fees uh, any more than you do. I mean, I in their right mind would prefer to pay $20 for something when, when it could be five. But I mean, like it's, this is, it's not just going to happen overnight. And like, I'm sure a lot of people have seen Cobra kind of being the, uh, the resident contrarian on Twitter lately, but he pretty much started giving him shit about uh, like saying, have faith. It went in uh, the tweet that Jonas made kind of, you know, pleading for patience. And, you know, I think this, this is kind of a larger trend that I really think is going to just explode over the next year. It's like 
core developers, like core supporters, people who, who use Bitcoin, like we're, we're not some homogenous thing. Like we're not all robots that have the exact same view on everything or think the exact same thing about every proposed solution. Like the, this is anarchy. This is an experiment in anarchy. And there is an unspeakable amount of diversity in the reactions and thoughts on all these different things. And I, I feel like the block size really just completely distorted the presentation of that reality. And I think now that we have like the, the Bcash fork off and now like both camps, for lack of a better word, have their own place to go to. Like, I think that's going to really come back to the forefront. Like, you know, nobody agrees on like the exact same perfect solutions. It, it's, I don't know, the, the whole thing is silly. And I, I can almost guarantee you that this is going to be like twisted and distorted in the media as like Bitcoin failing or, or falling apart because look at all these arguments people are having. And it's like, no, that's, that's what it always was. Like it, this has always been diverse people with diverse ideas. It's just, it, they always got sidelined. Right. I mean, it's open source, right? Like, I mean, this is the way like we move in Bitcoin and the development of Bitcoin and, you know, I think you're right. We might start to see like, uh, you know, that whole fight kind of come back to the forefront with people kind of picking sides and everything. But I, I think it's good that, you know, people who maybe are just coming into the scene who are been heard like, hey, core is this single entity. They see like us going back and forth. It's like because, you know, I mean, like, yeah, it's not. It's anarchy. It's like people don't agree all the time and like not not even close. And so, um, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's just one of those things that uh, kind of gets struck out on Twitter. And I'm sure like, yeah, there'll probably be some runaways with it saying like, hey, you know, look, this guy is from core and he's saying the same thing we are. And it'll be the same similar posturing again, but um, might uh, be some names that we weren't expecting to come out or something like that. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely something where when I first saw it, I was like, wait a minute, Cobra is talking like this now. <laughs> But, man, you know, 2018, things are changing. I guess a little uh, surprise share from Janine. This is actually a pretty cool thing they had at the uh, the Chaos Congress in uh, Germany. I guess uh, somebody set up a, a little uh, bot with a button, <laughs> and it would just automatically uh, pretty much create a lightning transaction every time somebody pushed it i guess we've had fifty thousand of them uh in the past three days that's i mean like it's, how can people still call this vaporware when like it, the implementations are all over the place surrounding them being used it, it boggles my freaking mind yeah i think uh that's perfect that's exactly what i was thinking when janine threw that up there was we're gonna have uh, a lot of debates about this stuff until the technology just answers the question, right? Like people are going to still be freaking out about transaction throughput until it's no longer a problem. And the people that are really good at lying, you know, like Roger Ver are going to use that narrative and they're going to take advantage of some people that are too slow um, to be able to figure out who's telling the truth. But, you know, we're not that far off from it just being really, really obvious. And then they'll, there'll be some other narrative that they're lying about, but that's the great thing about writing code is that you can't you can't argue with it, and when you can when you can actually touch it and use it and it works, everybody just shuts up. Mm -hmm. And um, to, to a quick response to Fubar in the chat, of course the button is centralized. How do you decentralize a button, you goof? <laughs> but um... yes, yeah. So quickly for further explanation on the box. So basically, I think the way it worked is that there were two boxes. Um, I think I assume they are probably there are two boxes um, in uh, in CCC and this one box that you saw was on the table and when you press the button it would uh, create a lightning transaction and send it and then it would be received by the uh, lightning address on I, I assume it was a lightning node um, but maybe not um, but anyway it was received by a lightning address stored at another box uh, somewhere somewhere else in the building 
So yeah, over the course of three days, if you walk by the box, you could push the button, it would send a lightning transaction. And apparently there was 50,000. Um, and then if you show the chart, this is something I reminded people um, in my latest blog post, like the events around Psycho2x, is that the, the, the amount of fee in Bitcoin terms has actually not gone up, guys. It hasn't. It just hasn't. It has gone up in 2015, but it has not gone up overall. Because if you look way back in 2011, even 2012, the fee rates were approaching the same level at multiple different points. The reason why we're freaking out about it now is because Bitcoin is now worth a lot more. So the problem is that for the major price increase that we've seen over the past uh, year, year and a half. Um, and so that's the major problem. That's what people are complaining about. They're not actually complaining about the fees getting bigger it, to any large or concerning extent. They're complaining about the fact that the fees are going up a historic, a historic peak, but the peak is not actually that large. It's the fact that the price of Bitcoin has gone up. So, yeah, I think this is something that needs to be pointed out a lot more often because, you know, a lot of people, every time they complain about fees, I wonder if they actually, um, the fees in Bitcoin terms are not that large. No, I'm glad that you pulled that up because uh, I hadn't seen that chart yet. And um, that's definitely a good visual, visual example of like, look, the fees are not as high as that you were in the past. And I mean, they're only high because like you're saying, the price rise of Bitcoin, really. Yeah, I mean, if like if you uh, go to the the Nakamoto Institute's website, they have a whole section of uh, Satoshi quotes, and there is actually um, like way back in like 2010, I think there was an instance where uh, somebody had pretty much had to pay a fee in order to get a transaction confirmed because it was condensing more than 500 inputs, and that that's another a nuanced thing that Roger always misrepresents. Back in the very early days, not all transactions were free. They had a, a limit where if a transaction included more than 500 inputs, even though almost none of the block space was being used, it was still a mandatory fee for the nodes to actually relay it. And at the time, the, the fee in this instance was actually 0.4 Bitcoin. And when this guy uh, pretty much complained about it on Bitcoin Talk, Satoshi's response was pretty much like he explained the, the reason for the mandated fee after so many inputs and pretty much told him, if you're not happy with it, well, you can always start mining and maybe collect a fee yourself one day. I mean, e even back then, in that situation, like Satoshi's answer was, well, if you don't like it, start mining. You can make the fees yourself. And like this has always been a necessary part of the system like did you need to have fees in the long term and like i'm, I'm about to go off on a tangent I'll, I'll try and find the link to include in the show notes afterwards but there's actually a big fundamental problem potentially in, in bitcoin with mining incentives that i'm not really convinced is actually a problem anymore after seeing how this fee market has developed recently but it's pretty much called a, a minor heart attack. And, and the idea is that, you know, as we have the price go up, you're going to have more and more miners come online, which pushes up the operating cost of all miners. And eventually this is going to hit a point where as the price starts leveling off and we don't see insane growth constantly, that's going to become razor thin like the, the profit margin between the cost of mining and what they're actually getting in revenue. But the halvings don't stop. And so like this, this creates a kind of a perfect shitstorm where in the long term, if we don't have a fee market, once those, those costs pretty much come into the, the place where the, those margins are completely razor thin, if a halvening happens after that, it could potentially, without a fee market replacing the subsidy as it disappears, make all miners unprofitable. And that could potentially kill the entire network. Like if you have like that slim of an operating cost versus profit, a halvening happens and all miners effectively get hit by that, that, that point where they're no longer profitable, that could just, the entire network could just grind to a halt. And this is a problem. 
that it's never really been publicized in the past year or so since we've had this huge wave of new users coming in. And like when, when you hear people argue about the necessity of a fee market, it, it's not for no reason. Like it, we literally need fees to replace the block reward over time. Otherwise, the system is just not sustainable because miners, they're not going to just mine out of the goodness of their heart. Like if, if they're at no, a consistent it's... loss, like th then this is done. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the way the incentive structure works. It's the way everything is balanced. Like it, we need a fee market. It's that, you know, like I, I don't understand the expectation that this works without it. Yeah, it really makes I mean, no sense. I think we'll probably hear a lot more about that after the 2020 happening, whenever there's going to be less than, you know, seven Bitcoin spitting out every 10 minutes. And then we'll start to hear Whoa. more about that. But uh, you're right. I mean, like the fee market has always been a part of the plan. And, you know, to just be like, well, the fees are some nuisance that shouldn't exist. I mean, that's just wrong. Well, it's already really expensive to avoid the blocks right now to, to mine an empty block, right? You mine an empty block, you're out like sometimes what? Like 12 BTC, like 30 BTC. That just seems absolutely insane to me. Yeah, I think the only thing I want to add is that there there are already known solutions to the to get our cake and eat it too, right? Something like lightning or side chains. Um, what they essentially what they do is they just aggregate a bunch of transactions together, right? So you can have you can have a ten thousand dollar fee, but if that is uh, settling transactions for forty thousand people, you're still only paying less than a dollar a transaction, right? Um, and that can go, you know much further extreme than, than even those numbers. So it's not like we don't have technical solutions to this problem that allow us to keep the security of the miners and the incentives of the miners to keep the network secure, but also provide transactions that are, you know, sub Satoshi and fees. Like we, we have that, that solution. The, um, the reality is there's just not, there hasn't been up to this point enough of a market for it. Right. I mean, Blockstream has liquid, it works, it's a side chain, it's functional, but there just hasn't been enough demand for it. So it takes time for this stuff to to develop. And I think, you know, if you just sent some money to your buddy and it was 14 bucks, you're pissed off and you think there's plenty of a market for it, but that doesn't mean that there actually is. We, we're still sort of in the store of value st stage of adopting a currency. It's not really a medium of exchange time yet. And uh, I think that's the reason that we don't see a lot of the, the solutions. You know, I, I'm glad that we have people working on Lightning, but the fact that there's only 10 of them are still working on it. It could mean that, that, you know, everybody's crazy and just doesn't understand how important it is, or it could be that now we're just not there yet. Right. It's still, we're, we're just not at that phase of adoption yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. I was just going to say like, yeah, like, um, you know, that's one thing where it's like, I've been watching these videos from, uh, you know, other guys in the space that have a lot of clout like Zoku and, um, you know, Charles Hokinson and like, you know, I don't know. It's like, uh, I just wish that, uh, you know, we would start seeing like more guys come over to help SegWit scale and like, you know, develop on things like lightning where like, you know, we could use bright minds and like, you know, get things well, done. But I, I, I think, I think you're exactly right there, Rick. Like the, the, um, you know, like these guys would be great to have them on board and working on some of this stuff now. But I mean, the the hardware and the software really does need to come a long way. There's still a lot to be said for the general like uh, architecture and how that will play out in the future. And I think that we need to get a lot of that experimentation done before companies like Intel and AMD decide to actually implement the changes that we need to see as Bitcoiners in their hardware so that the software and everything can grow to, to expand as this ecosystem really needs it to. So I don't really think that it's that it's unwise that that we're kind of taking the time to get there because we need it. We need that time and we need everyone to get on the same page. And there's a lot of communication and stuff that needs to happen before we get there. I can agree that it's going to like, you know, we need a little bit of time to get this thing through. But, um, you know, I don't I don't know if uh, necessarily going to be able to wait the time for Intel and AMD to come around. I, I don't know. I, I see those systems. It's like they're not going to keep up and catch up and play the game. Then they'll just lose out. I don't know.
so I can, well that's yeah. that's the issue we need to have this hardware securely and easily verifiable by as many people as possible and and we need to mitigate some of the effects that exist in the software and hardware development like uh cultures right the hardware needs to be um more secure and without backdoors and without as many bugs so that the software designers and developers can build on that hardware with peace of mind, knowing that they can write uh, what they think is or, or the best uh, according to them, right? Uh, so we actually get closer to ideal code and ideal functions written for the computer, right? So that we can have stuff that we can more easily trust and depend on than our current ecosystem. And I think that Bitcoin built around that for it to reach its ultimate goal. So I see that as a full piece of the picture. And it's just one of those things that will get ticked off for the, the, the goals along the way. It's like part of the roadmap that we kind of, uh, to understand the, the, the new changes that we've had in technology and, and you know, especially the, the kind of enlightenment that we've gotten from uh, Bitcoin as far as decentralized systems and, and internet technology goes, right? But as far as those revelations go, to say it's enough to turn Intel and AMD around to stop doing the government's bidding, I just don't think that's going to happen. I just, I don't think that's going to happen. Well, it's, you know, it's we got kind it. of a longer time frame, too. I mean, like, that's, like, regardless of whether they're actually going to kind of pull their head out of their ass in that respect, like, that's going to take generations. I mean, like, we need to kind of start with baby steps and think, like, what's the real core like danger here it's key management i mean and so we need to start the dimes like, and st i'm sorry <laughs> go ahead yeah but it's like exactly like we need to start with that special purpose hardware to deal with that key management and like actual transaction signing to interact with things and get that foundation settled first because if we can yep. get that foundation set up well then it doesn't really matter how much everything else is fucked because the, the important part, that that key management is on a secure level. And yeah, we're, we're already, we're, we're very much so already headed in the right direction there. And I think that's a good starting point. And I think that by slowly executing and checking these things off the list, like, uh, you know, Intel and, and all these guys are already involved in the Hyperledger project. Eventually, you know, I think they'll grow to, to be able to, and it, it, it all just, it, it, it takes us getting on the same page and we're not there yet. And I think that that could happen a lot sooner than generations. Like I, I think that we could be there, you know, within years. Um, so I think we're that far off the uh, the beaten path, if you know what I mean. And I think there's uh, just a few changes and, and Bitcoin to grow a little bit and, uh, you know, XUI designs coming out and uh, we could be there, you know. I don't know, man. I, I feel like there's some sort of in-between phase there where it's like, you know, you got to use open dimes and trezors and, you know, know that your uh, hardware that you're using is uh, going to be secure for, I mean, I understand. I mean, like, I feel like that's a rabbit hole that I don't know if you're ever going to get out of as far as like secure hardware. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know. I... Uh, the market will demand it eventually. It's one of those things that uh, when it comes about it comes about so fast it's already in front of you and then uh you know the pivots are already in, unfolding and i think you know we'll look back uh upon a couple of months ago maybe or you know a year ago and we'll say that's when it happened you know but uh we don't know it's like one of those things it, when you look at things in retrospect you know w when did the actual pivotal like point happen you know it's always hard to identify things like that i don't know man i think we're ready yeah, I don't, I, I don't see any huge technology problems between now and, you know, Bitcoinization. I actually, that's part of the reason why I'm kind of chilled about all of the, um, I don't know, all the things that everybody's passionate about. And yeah, you know, I mean, it the, really, I mean, right, it doesn't really take much to fix the issue. Like, uh, that, that's the hardware kind of first and then software and then it's done, you know, like it's not a lot of work. Right. I, I don't even think that's the long pull at this point. Like, I think that the technology is far enough along and it's coming at a, a rapid enough pace to where it's actually staying ahead of the, the social adoption. Right. And so I think we don't really need to have medium of exchange capability 
beyond just helping people understand that it's coming until we're kind of out of that store of value phase. So for me, yes, just, that's I'm, exactly what, I'm just sorry, for interrupting. 5 million, right? And when Bitcoin's at 5 million a coin, then I'm expecting to walk down to the 7-Eleven or whatever and be able to grab a card with Bitcoin on it and be able to grab an open dime off the shelf, right? Like that stuff will be there probably before it's even needed um, because it's just going to take time for people to learn about it, understand it. And, you know, it is a little bit of a chicken and egg in the sense that I'm really glad we have Lightning coming online because, because the educational factor that it will have for people and helping them understand that it's an amazing store of value because it's going to be an amazingly useful asset. Um, but that's, that's really, you know, that's really the main thing that these things are bringing is just helping people understand that they should put their money in Bitcoin because until everybody has their money in Bitcoin, you know, you don't really need to trade in Bitcoin. It doesn't really make any sense. It still takes you four or five or six or 10 days to get your money out of fiat and into Bitcoin because you have to use that old crappy legacy system. So who cares if it, you know, if you have to put a really low fee on it and uh, when the network's not being spammed, it takes, you know, two days. That's not even the long pull. The long pull is dealing with your old legacy crap. So until we don't have to deal with the old legacy crap, you know, and and that's, I don't know, it's it's at least 500,000 plus a coin, right? So that, that's why I'm interested in the price because it reflects adoption and that's what I'm waiting for. Yeah, that's, that's kind of my point and all that, that, you know, we don't need to get this stuff tackled immediately because I think it's already like we already have the direction and the momentum and we're going to get there no matter which way we're looking at it. Well, real quick to like uh, add a little preface before I pass it off to Janine. I mean, like if you look at like Intel and things like the management engine, like, yeah, that that is a horrible problem. But, you know, like I said earlier, the, the issue here in dealing with cryptocurrency security is managing the keys. And so if you can get that key management and that transaction management off of this hardware, it can be as fundamentally fucked as, as they can make it, but it still won't matter when it comes to your, your you securing your assets. Yeah, which I mean, you can already do that by just having good OPSEC and knowing how Bitcoin works pretty well. But uh, yeah, I totally agree. You know, the key signing, the, being able to do that in these hardware devices and stuff like that are, you know, with the, the first like bit, right? Like get the secure hardware, get it out there, show that there is value in it and all that. And then the secure processing and everything like that comes after. Like, I, I think that's very logical. Yep. And uh, I mean, like, I'm, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm with y'all 100%. I think that we definitely have the momentum and we're going there and we're going to get there. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just going to take a little bit more time. And, uh, We'll be uh, headed towards this place where, you know, we can go to the store and, you know, use Bitcoin and it's not going to be such a headache. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to go over this tweet you just uh, gave me, though, Jeannie? Yeah, so uh, speaking of legacy crap, um, I thought it. I thought I wanted to give a little plug to this talk. Uh, it was one of the talks at CCC, um, I believe it was two days ago, yeah. Um, now the talk wasn't as good as I expected it to be because you know when you when you have these talks at CCC they even if they talk about how something works they also talk about how it doesn't work like how it's broken and how you can break it or how they've broken it. Unfortunately, this talk did, didn't get into it. I didn't really expect them to because as you can see, it, the talk was uh, uh, done by a guy who works for PayWorks, which is basically a payment gateway software company. So you wouldn't expect them to throw a lot of shit on, you know, the faults of uh, payment networks. But if you want to know how contactless payments work, um, this was a really good talk. It was quite uh, illuminating to how many middlemen are involved in literally just hovering your card for a few seconds over a little, um, uh, processing box and then like all the people that all of this transaction data goes to it's like it's like insane just for like usually contactless payments i think are for sub 30 dollar payments i think that's usually the limit um but yeah the yeah the, <laughs> it's it's so crazy how many people are involved in stuff like this so if you want to know about how uh what kind of like 
guess, uh, lightning will be replacing. Um, I think that was interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, it's, you know, like Luke uh, mentions in here, though, like, you know, even like the, the ME, like the management engine is, is in a way used to kind of mitigate hardware flaws. So I mean, like, it really is, it's not going to just be like snap to start trying to fix like all the, the potential holes and things. We just, we need to like think managing our keys and managing what those keys are signing and isolating that. And then from there, it's kind of immune to all these other problems. And we can just start like progressively moving to tackle each one as we go. And it's, I think that's a lot more of a kind of temper your expectations a little bit and know that like the most important aspect of like getting more secure platforms is already here, like safe key management devices. Yeah, and in case anyone wasn't aware, um, the reason why Luke was pointing out that um, neutralized or disabled ME um, options w is one of the things that the Purism laptop does, which is, you know, considered one of those laptops that tries to aim for a more hardware security, um, which I thought was great. Like, I, th I thought, you know, oh, yay, dis Intel ME is disabled. I love that. Um, and then to find out from Luke, uh, I believe he only tweeted that a few days ago, but, but to find out from Luke that, oh, actually when you disable the ME, it causes all of this other problems because of how shitty Intel hardware is. It's like, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I mean, it's like, it, it sucks, but it's like, it's what we have to deal with. You know what I mean? It's, we got to take the tools we have and do what we can with them. But, uh, Let's take a look at another thing Mr. Contrarian was uh, was talking about while we were, uh, we were off. I <laughs> felt the need to, to ask why all of these coercive fork attempts aren't uh, attempting to use soft forks to uh, pretty much force these kinds of changes on the network. And like kind of my two cents on that is really simple. It's, it's the game theory. Like, it, it, if you have a situation where you have a coercive hard fork like that, it's effectively something that requires a majority of miners to enforce. So if there isn't really consensus behind like that, that soft fork, semantically, it's no different than a 51% attack. Like that would actually be miners attacking the network. And I think very quickly, Brium, in just the game theory incentives of all the individual actors would fall apart. And I think very, very quickly, you would have everybody except the miners on one side of a table going, you know what? You guys are fired. Because at, at that point, like, why would you continue utilizing that system in that way when it's, it's just changed the proof of work and, and the problem is gone? And I think like that's very telling that they they don't try that because they recognize that that very likely would be the response to that. Well, it's not like it hasn't been attempted, right? I mean, we haven't had any successful attacks on Bitcoin, but if he would uh, stop tweeting nonsense and go out and read the threat model, he'd know that there there have been attempts, just like Segment 2X was an attack, there have been attempts to do soft fork attacks, right? We had Bitcoin XT, we had Bitcoin Unlimited. I'm sure that there was a lot of other ideas floated that didn't get as much kind of media the extension attention. block from our purse.io. Yeah. But yeah, they totally. actually, they never really followed through with it. Yep. Yep. Totally. It, but that doesn't mean it wasn't an attempted attack. They just failed to get the consensus, right? And the, the support that they would need to pull it off. But um, but yeah, no, that's that has been attempted there, Cobra. It just hasn't worked, just like Segwit 2X didn't work. And hopefully like half of the things that you're suggesting about changing proof of work won't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, it's, it's really, it's just like, they have to be able to convince people to do it at the end of the day, or like they're fired. It's, it's really that simple. And yeah, I really hope Cobra doesn't go run off and try to coordinate something like this now to create a justification for proof of work change. Calling it. Yeah. yeah I'm I know. calling it. Got that word. If I remember, 
If I remember correctly, I think Vitalik made the argument that soft forks were actually coercive instead of hard forks because um, he said, uh, I have a quote here, soft forks clearly institutionally favor coercion over secession, whereas hard forks have the opposite bias. So he's saying it's better to have a hard fork because you have the option to secede, whereas with soft forks that, I don't know, and backwards compatible, and that's a bad thing. But of course, you can always I mean, secede. Uh, do you play with, right? <laughs> that's exactly yeah, I mean, well, the thing those guys use. Yeah, I mean, because the thing for me, it's like, I don't see how a soft fork is really coercive because the whole point of backwards compatible is that you don't have to use it. You can opt into it any time. Like, as you can clearly see, people who are not using SegWit addresses are still able to send Bitcoin, even though the fees are a lot higher than SegWit transactions. The use SegWit transactions is because that increases transaction throughput and it lowers your fees, but you don't have to use it. It's all happening on the same chain. So I don't see how that's coercion. And if you're determined to keep a security bug like transaction malleability, then you just hard fork off like Bcash did. No, no big deal. But um, the, the advantage of what we did is that if you didn't take action, you ended up with the more secure network, right? And that's just like, the basic human decency that, uh, <laughs> that we should show to people that are uh, that are investing in this technology. Yeah, I think it's, um, I don't know, I've just been thinking about like this big blocker, the high fee argument to where it's like, eventually maybe they'll realize like, oh, the, the low fees are on SegWit, like we need to use SegWit addresses and like maybe they'll start to learn that way because, uh, yeah, <laughs> we need it. All right, and now a surprise to any Briar Patchians watching right now, expecting Shinobi Monkey to be running an experiment. You just got trolled. You just got trolled hard fucking court. So we're gonna we're gonna slide over to this Mike in Space poll, asking about the the database incident in uh, 2013, and uh, I'm sure like. If uh, if you haven't read it, you can obviously go look up uh, you know Mike's account, Luke's account, or my account, and dig through some of the threads. But pretty much, people have been expecting, as I said, for me to actually try to bootstrap an old node uh, pre uh, version 0.8. But the complications of the the peer to peer layer being changed since then aside, um, if I actually were to take the old client base, make the peer-to-peer -peer layer compatible with current nodes, and then bootstrap the node, it literally doesn't matter whether it syncs or not. It, like That proves absolutely nothing. And anybody who thinks that it would have, uh, you didn't really kind of grasp like what is going on here in this incident. Like Pretty much when you have a database uh, dealing with a or, brain fart. When you have a program dealing with a database or interacting with it, there is a thing called a lock. And an entry in that database will be locked when one process goes to modify or deal with it or input data to that, that entry point. And it will stay locked until that process is done with it. And this is done so that you don't have two conflicting like programs or processes trying to modify data and the order of that being screwed up. Uh, doing something like affecting the result that one of them might have and completely just throwing the whole program off. Well, the entire issue with with this whole split and fork is that there was a, a limit on the number of locks. But the number of locks that your, your device actually uses, it's totally non-deterministic. Like, if you have other processes running on your computer, that's going to affect how fast that program can interact with that database and how many locks it uses, like different hardware. All kinds of different factors are going to inform, like, your individual device and how many database locks it uses. So whether or not your client with an old database format could sync to the tip of this current chain, it's completely random, pretty much. Like, there is no like this definitively did this or did that. Like whether a node actually syncs in that instance or not, it doesn't matter because whether it does or not, 
is pretty much completely random. And this is why that we actually like upgraded to a new format and instituted a constant number of locks allowed by this because prior to that even, there, there was no way of knowing whether a block would be constructed that would cause a split like that. Like it, it was literally completely random. At, at that point in time, that split happened and any time prior to that, any node could have just randomly forked off depending on how it was specifically performing, the specific hardware it used, and there would be no consistent deterministic reason for that. It, it, it was literally in a way kind of like a, a Schrodinger's consensus rule. Like you may or may not be following the rule at any given time and it's just going to collapse into a state without any kind of consistent reason for it. So to kind of be a smart ass here, it's, it's, it's Schrodinger's hard fork. <laughs> we don't know whether we've hard forked or whether we've not hard forked. All we know right now is that unless you hack together a, a new peer-to-peer -peer layer implementation for, for an old node format, you're running a new node that is compatible with that, that will not split from all the other nodes out there. So I'm sure a lot of people are going to go run off into the winds and, and wildly speculate about what this means semantically. But hey, if we did actually hard fork, whether it's been observed or not, it clearly doesn't matter because there is not a single person out there still running that client and complaining about it or having been forked off the, the wider network that we're all participating on. So uh, I guess DeSantis is right. Bitcoin is quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah, but Shinobi, how about you try it on uh, 0.92, right? You can do it on another client, right? Do it uh, without the level DB one, right? Do the BDB one, right? Let's test that. Let's make sure that still works. I think this is why that answer came out. It's complicated because it is, does sound complicated. But I mean, that test wouldn't really prove anything. Like, that's kind of the point, Acnix. Like, you, it doesn't, just running a specific database version is not going to be the determining factor on whether or not you split off from everybody else. It is going to be completely random and down to all kinds of different things, like your heart. Yeah, but I mean, we're, now we're, we're twisting what the thing is. We got to just make sure it syncs and validates, right? Does it work? No, question mark. We're not. Yes, right? At all. I think you're kind of you ignore the, the nuance of the situation here. I I am, but still, I'm still curious. Does it work? Does it not? You know, I want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Well, you, you can do that, but it's regardless of how that, that test uh, performs, it's not really indicative of anything, really. Well, I mean, it, it'll it'll work or it won't work, right? I mean, it, it will participate and do some good service to the network or not. I mean, we know that basically by version number, what it will and won't do theoretically, but does it actually work? Like, I think there is a valid, you know. Dude, I think you're kind of so. missing the point is it doesn't matter because whether you're. Well, see, specific. this is what I was saying then. Well, if it, it doesn't matter and if backwards compatibility doesn't matter, then let's just fix all the nasty like, you're, complexity you're, dude, in the code that we have. You're completely, like, completely the point. What your running of that am. experiment I, does I think that has absolutely point. nothing to do with how anybody else is conducting that experiment will run. It is totally non-deterministic. Yeah, it sounds like yeah, it's... Uh... it's just... If you run, yeah, if right. you try to sync up a node, it might not necessarily work. But if you do on this other piece of equipment, it might sync. It's really kind of up in the air. And um, I mean, as far as uh, old nodes that are running that so that version of the client, then I mean, like they should have already been synced, and they're still on the network, right? Yeah, I mean the license. The license I agreed to. Uh, you know, they were deterministic builds, weren't they? They were supposed to be deterministic, right? I thought that they were cross-platform and they ran on multiple different hardware. You know, I thought that that would, uh, you know, <laughs> sync up with the Bitcoin network. You know, this has nothing to do with with a Gideon build or the actual source code. This is how your hardware actually uh, I, i'm aware shinobi i'm aware but i mean uh, it, 
kind of makes sense to me that if I have two pieces of hardware that are the same and I try this old wallet and it runs and it validates blocks or it does or it doesn't, right, that that's still interesting. Am I, am I wrong? Am I an idiot for thinking? No, that? it's because not. It's indicative of nothing. I don't see it that way. So, like, basically you're saying, you know, maybe it didn't run on anything, but we know it ran on something. We know it ran on most plethora of devices. Otherwise, we'd have a bunch of complaints in GitHub about how it didn't work. But, you know, like, I, I don't I don't really necessarily understand the point besides, well, well it made machines. But that's something we all knew about all nodes already, right? No, I this, like this sounds like a good topic for a, a topical debate that we should have and just dedicate a whole episode to it and put it out right. there outside of block digest. Yeah. We have way too many news stories to get through with this level of uh, analysis. Yeah. I'm, uh, but, um, yeah. yeah. But uh, anybody who actually wants to look into a complete history of every consensus chain, there was actually a uh, pretty good compilation of all this put together by this BitMEX uh, research account that everybody can look at. Well, I do think it's kind of an interesting question to ask is that, is it possible with these, you know, con um, ch changes, if you have enough very small changes over time, do they eventually add up collectively to a kind of fork, even though none of the individual changes themselves would have caused a fork? I mean, you see that in evolution. I mean, you have, um, you have horses and donkeys, which are, they appear to be of the same species, but actually they when they breed, they don't produce reproductive offspring. That's what mules are. They're basically donkey and horse offspring that can't actually produce any further offspring. Um, so even though even though they're compatible technically, they're they're not in an evolutionary sense. So I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of thing is happening with code on some level. Well, no, it could, it's not about the code. It's about how the code interacts with the database. And, like, the overall point is, like, it is, there is absolutely no guarantee that having that old database format is going to produce a consistent result when you apply new data to it, access current data, like there is absolutely no consistent deterministic like standard by which you can observe that behavior there are it, it, like it's really uncontrollable the amount of environmental factors that could just randomly cause different behavior and like it's like i said it's literally it was like a schrodinger's consensus rule that could have happened at any time for any number of irrelevant reasons at any point in the past, which was why the entire like new database format was instituted and an actual like consistent limit on database locks that could be used was instituted. Oh bring shit. The cat, bring the cat, cat. bring the cat. <laughs> it's time for kitty comfort. All right, cat, what do you think? Did we hard fork? Did we not hard fork? All right, Bugs. Did we hard fork in 2013? I think that was, I think that was, a, I don't fucking know. This is complicated as shit, dude. Y'all just need to keep moving on. Oh, jeez. All right, Bugs. Sorry to wake you, man. I had to ask him. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, speaking of random uh, hilarious things, though. Uh, this, this was fucking hilarious. <coughs> Pirate Bay, I fucking love you guys. <laughs> yeah, what a great, uh, little Christmas troll that was. I saw that. I'm sorry, laughing too. Thank you, Pirate Bay. I think it's a nice contrast to the fact that Bcash chose a fake CEO, Pirate, as their CEO. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, I I just love seeing the fact that, like, uh, uh, an operation that is pretty much hounded and harassed and targeted by law enforcement and governments everywhere. Like, what, what after this fork happened, and you see all these other sites and institutions going, yeah, donate with Bcash. They just laugh at it. Like, no, 
Like th this isn't going to help us in the long term uh, unless we immediately take this and, and sell it off for something else. Like this is just a liability and it's not really going to give us any aid in the long term. Yeah, I'm glad to see that uh, and take that position on Bcash and, you know, hope to see more like the places that use crypto, like start to take that stance. Although I believe a number of people are still upset with Pirate Bay for the fact that they were running some of that um, mining microcode on their website when visitors were. I believe Pirate Bay was doing that. <laughs> so but they told their customers, though, they, didn't they? They told them, like, we're experimenting with I this. I think so. Yeah, I think they had a disclaimer somewhere, although, you know, people still get mad because the CPU freaking out. Yeah. See, I don't. I didn't really get what the issue was with that. I mean, it's something that is like easily throttleable, so that it's not just hogging every bit of unused, like uh, you know, cycle you have. Like they they should have fine tuned yeah. that a little more and continued experimenting, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I i like I'm okay with it as long as they're making. I mean, no one's forcing anyone to go to their website as long as they're, you know, may, it's they're not doing it surreptitiously and they're making people aware that they're doing it i think it's fine like if i can if i have the option to because the thing is your cpu gets like overrun by these ads all the time so it's like if i can choose between getting tracked and surveilled by all these stupid ads all over the web or and having it mine some cryptocurrency in the background so that it doesn't have to you know dial into this like parasitical advertising ecosystem i'd go with the mining as long you know again as long as it's consensual and they're making it, um i think it's an interesting replacement for advertising a lot better than a token that got talked a lot about already <laughs> yeah I'm no you. ico for that mm -hmm. but uh yeah keeping with the uh the, the previous contrarian though uh I think we've got another one. And, you know, this, like, this is, I, I don't really know how to feel about, like, Amir's recent string of tweets. Like, you know, it's Bitcoin is turning into a failed project. Like, why? Like, I, I just, like, I really respect Amir and, like, what he's contributed to in this space, especially philosophically. But I just, I think that's kind of just alarmist and reactionary uh, statement to me. Like that's like how is Bitcoin a failed project, right? Like in what way is it not functioning? I've I've asked him like two or four times and I've never got an answer. So I think his tweet was actually pretty informative in that he said, You're not gonna understand what I'm talking about. And I don't. I have no idea what he's talking about. So maybe maybe he's right. Maybe one day I will understand his words, but I've probably watched three hours of his talks and uh put far too much time into it and I still have no idea what the hell he's talking about. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't give you one sentence of what he believes about any one thing. And I've given him way too much time to be in that state of absolute confusion. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't really know what to think about it either. The only thing I can think of is that maybe he's reacting to, I haven't really, um, I haven't really seen a ton of interest in the two project. I mean, I think I've seen interest in the fact that he wants to make um, Bitcoin the national currency of Rojava. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but I think people are interested in that. Um, but, <laughs> oh my God. That was very disturbing. <laughs> what was that? It was pixelated enough to where I wasn't sure what I was looking at. I, I was really nervous there. Yeah. He can't, that's what that was. <laughs> Is we'll that an actual cat? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a chill cat. Can oh, he's just sleeping. I'll, I'm sorry. I was going to say about the severe thing, like, uh, since we're on it, it's just, um, you know, one thing I've noticed about some guys getting upset is, like, just the mainstream kind of, like, talk about it. Just seeing it on the news, on the C on NBC and ABC and CBS, they just get so upset. They're like, this is not crypto. And they get pissed and they come on the mumble and they, they yell about it. And, you know, I know that uh, there's also been, you know, just a lot of money being made 
in the past year. And I mean, like maybe that's upsetting him in some sort of way. I mean, like there's a couple of angles where I could see like maybe this is upsetting him in the space. And, um, you know, because, yeah, like you're, you know, he's a he's a real uh, philosophical contrarian person who I mean, like, I think that he has like that cypher punk movement in him. I just think he's seeing some things that might be upsetting to him. All right, just 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 for the heck of it, can anybody tell me what he is trying to accomplish in the world? Like, does he, does he want a socialist utopia? Does he want a like a military dictatorship? Um, how does Bitcoin? I, fit I, in what he, like, I totally no, don't know. So I, no, I, I, feel I don't like think it would so. be a good opportunity to challenge you guys to, to summarize anything about what he actually believes. Oh, if you want to go ahead first, James. Yeah. Well, I was just going to, before, uh, you know, the cat took over the screen, um, I was saying that I think one of the reasons maybe that he's disappointed is because maybe he expected more people to be interested in his projects. Like, um, I believe the second one, he wanted to start a hacker academy in Cyprus. And uh, I didn't see him do a lot of campaigning for funding for that, but maybe that's what he was expecting and it didn't really happen. So maybe... I don't know. He just the he was angry that his expectation didn't. Yeah, and I mean the only other thing I can think of is that because you know he I, I agree with him that you know I do think people get a little overzealous about announcing the price. Like I re I mean like I feel good about it, but I don't like I don't constantly look at the price because honestly, it's like keep going up. It's going to also go down at some point. I don't feel like, you know, spending a lot of my day, like, staring at the price. And so maybe he's just, but I don't think people being obsessed with the price is necessarily a failure of Bitcoin. I think it's just that social media does that. You get excited about stuff and you want to connect with other people. And if a price is that thing that you want to connect over, I think that's fine. I don't necessarily see it as failure. I see it as a, a bit weird how um, people get very uh, sometimes overexcited about it um, and focus on it too much. And, you know, a lot what what should be talked about more is, you know, how do we educate new people? How do we, in, you know, improve the user interface and everything? So if that's his point, then I would agree with him on that. That's a sign that Bitcoin is necessary failure. I think it's just maybe an annoyance, um, but that's all I could think of. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, like to kind of just, uh, I guess, half project, half uh, conjecture a little bit about it. I think what he's really been looking for this whole time is actual like social collectives forming for specific goals and actually just wholly throwing themselves into it. And, you know, I can kind of like get why he, he looks at the, the lack of that really picking up pace so fast is, is moving towards failure, but you know, not, not to talk shit about him, but I, I think it, it's more just impatience. I mean, like these things are coming. Like we, we, all the, all the primitives to really do that kind of thing need to actually be built first. And they are, I mean, like, just look at something like open timestamps. I mean, like that, nobody talks about it. Nobody actually looks at what that is, what it can be used for, like recognize it, recognizes it for the tool that it is. Like, whereas, you know, I look at that and I see five years from now, the entire internet could be regularly timestamped every 10 minutes. The state of, of news pages, of social media pages, like all of the information flows could be one day it just a standard protocol. Everything is constantly rollingly getting hashed, condensed into a Merkle root and stamped into the Bitcoin blockchain every 10 minutes and give us a map to actually see the, the, like the differentials in how information is presented and changed over like time periods. And that like that would fundamentally change the entire face of the internet but like it's nobody's looking at it nobody's really like thinking like hey we can i am <laughs> well you're a brilliant exception I, I i have some yeah there are some surprises in that regard coming uh from uh at least chris and i and another individual in the next year which i can't talk about quite yet but yeah <laughs> we're looking at it
the only the only thing that I could I can think of is that you know as, as you were summarizing his view, and I have to interact with like your summary of his view because <laughs> that's the most coherent concept I've heard. But the the problem with that is that Bitcoin is not about necessarily changing people's values, right? We're not going to suddenly wake up and be a different kind of human that wants to live in a socialist, uh, you know, commune and focus on recycling all day, right? That's not what Bitcoin's about. Bitcoin is about empowering individuals and giving people individual freedom. And I think a lot of us are hopeful that that will result in a lot more um, tendency towards selflessness the way that it does normally in a market. But, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, if you're if you're unhappy with the things that people love, you need to go into um, you need to become a religious teacher, not a Bitcoiner. Right. Bitcoin is about empowering the individual, not convincing the individual that they should worship your God and have your values. So I don't know if that's a fair way to respond to his actual views, but I do get that vibe. Right. That his main frustration is that this is not resulting in people loving and caring about the things that he wants them to love and care about. But I think he's just picked the totally wrong form for that. Well, see, and that's kind of why I said, like, you know, based on my perception of like his views, I think it's just impatience because like, I like those, those things, they will come in time, but it's, it's not what most people are going to do. with it. It's not what, what the people here now are going to do with it. It's not going to happen overnight. Like he, like it's, it's, you it's like you you don't have like the majority of people l like running through the entire way the federal reserve like manages the economy and how they project and like you know actually study numbers to base decisions on because most people just don't care about that but those people do exist they are actually out there watching and paying attention to those things and critiquing and scrutinizing those things but it's you, we're never going to have a world where it's everybody doing that because most people are just, they're going to want to just, you know, do good for themselves, go live their life and, and not worry about those kinds of issues. And I think he just, he needs to have a little more patience for the people who are going to throw themselves into things like that to actually get here and wrap their head around this stuff and decide what they want to do so that they can start kind of gravitating towards each other regarding like similar goals or ideas i gotta go back to the communication thing though because even if he is trying to convince me that i should care about some kind of uh socialist commune experience which is going to be a tough sell right to somebody like me that's very much an individualist um i still don't even know what he means right like i don't know what he's trying to sell i don't know what um what selfishness or social concerns that he thinks are um, not being paid attention to. Like, I, I don't even know that, right? Like I, I can argue with a socialist. I can argue with a Marxist or a leftist or, um, or a conservative, right? Because they give me some coherent ideas that I can deal with. I'm, I, I'm just at a loss, man. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, this, like, I'm not, yeah. I, Exactly. Like, I, I don't really know what to make of this tweet. I mean, like, do you, do you have any, like, input on this, Janine? Well, I think... And it's not I mean, just, to be clear, it's not just this tweet. Like I said, I've probably put three hours into watching YouTube videos. You know, his, his talk at, um, I don't know, the last couple talks he, he gave, I think I watched. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I can think is, you know, the when he left like bitcoin was still very small it was very subversive it didn't have a lot of you know industry acceptance or interest and i think maybe now that he's come back and he's seen a lot of that he maybe he thinks that that's i, I don't know the institutions that are coming in using you know touting about blockchain and everything maybe he's mistaken that for you know takeover of bitcoin i don't know because I mean, to me, I'm not at all worried about the state of Bitcoin development. That's actually the least of my worries. My biggest worry is the social stuff. It's about um, information asymmetry and things like that. It's about, you know, educating people. And so maybe maybe he's kind of suffered from that is that he since coming back, he hasn't quite parsed like all of the new people who have gotten into this space and 
I'm not quite sure if he thinks democracy is good, JW. Uh, I, he's used because well, that's that the thing. They, like, I, I have no yeah. idea what he believes about any specific thing, right? Like the way that he uses language is like uh, uh, it's it's not to communicate anything other than emotions and feelings, right? So like I've watched this talk. Yeah. I still couldn't tell you what the thesis was, not even whether I agree with it or not. Just like w w what was the point? I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I know about I know a lot of people who they they criticize democracy, but they'll they use democracy in the sense of just you know individuals having power, like in I guess in some like people power that they use the term democracy to mean like, which obviously in practice we have seen that doesn't really um, <laughs> end up being the case. Um, but yeah, I've seen people that they, they use, like, there's almost two versions of democracy that they use. So maybe he's one of those people that he means democracy and in, in, to be able to make decisions about their lives and their communities. Um, but then I've also I heard know him, if he's used the yeah. word. I was just trying to like, ask like a very basic question about what he's trying to accomplish and the tools that he thinks are good for that. I mean, the only thing that I know is he thinks that maybe hacking is a good idea, um, and I assume that he means writing software. But that's that's the only thing I can say that it's like even definitive. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, he's a bit hard to pin down. <laughs> I mean, like he left and went to Syria, right? And then he came back from Syria, and he's got this opinion. And I mean, like, you know. Dude went to war and came back from war. Like, I mean, his opinions are not going to be the exact same. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. Like, uh, I could tell you somebody that, you know, joined the army and ran off was just like, you know, I don't know what the hell the world was about. I'm trying to go try and figure it out, you know? And I mean, like, uh, maybe that's kind of the place he was in. And, you know, I don't know. It's really hard to say. What exactly? I mean, like, if he would be more, you know, kind of detailed out, it would be nice to hear. But um, because yeah. I'd like to hear where he's coming from on it. Yeah, I mean, I do know yeah. he's because one of the things he was trying to do in Rajava is like organize a direct democracy system. So I think he is a fan of direct democracy, at least in the short term. Um, but I don't know what his general idea of that. I mean, he talks about free societies all the time, so I'm assuming that. You know, anytime there's a democracy or democratic system that either it's, you know, kind of like the minarchist equivalent where, you know, it's a, it's like a transition period or something. I don't know. Um, I, like Adam, but, I like Adam Back's version of explaining democracy. It's three wolves and a sheep deciding what to have to, for dinner. Yeah, I can't really argue with that. <sighs> But, but I, I mean, that's, I think those are the sort of things that are important to try to narrow down, right? Because the whole cypherpunk, cypherpunk anarcho-capitalist um, sort of mindset that gave us Bitcoin, and I think a lot of people assume that he has, um, he might not have, but, but I don't know. I mean, it'd be nice to know, um, especially since he's trying to be, you know, the Bitcoin preacher. So it'd be nice to know what, uh, what religion he ascribes to. What I do know is he is definitely not in favor of monarchies because I saw a tweet from him a few days ago. Let me grab it. He was calling, he was calling, I believe, Prince Harry a monkey. <laughs> oh yeah, I found it. Ugly, retarded, red <laughs> chimp. <laughs> he was calling Prince. It was a. It, he was responding to um, a BBC tweet about. Um, asking something about Prince Harry's wedding, and he called him um, a chimp, which people were not very <laughs> happy with. <laughs> As you can yeah, see by the comments, I got I got to give him that. He, he's definitely you know he can turn a phrase. That's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, because I mean, in that like, no, I mean that is a bit. I I wouldn't I wouldn't use those terms to criticize someone because there's much better ways. But um, I mean, I, I believe that his the sentiment he was trying to get across is like, why are we, why do we care whether Barack Obama got an invitation to a prince's wedding? Like, why do we have princes in the first place? Because he said multiple times, like he, uh, when uh, he was talking about like the fact, you know, he lives in the UK, which is called a democracy, but no, it's actually a constitutional, um, 
<laughs> it's a constitutional monarchy. You still have these, uh, you know, kings and queens and stuff. It's like, why? They're basically just celebrities. They don't really have that much power anymore. I mean, the queen does have power as head of state, but it's just so weird to think that, you know, people are obsessed with questions like whether the president of the United States got an invite to the presence in another country. It's just a weird thing to be concerned with. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I, I think monarchies are a bad idea. I think democracies are a worse idea. I think I can make a really coherent um, argument for it that you may or may not agree with, right? You might decide that monarchies are worse after listening to me, but at least you'd know where I was coming from. So I don't know. That's kind of my, that's as far as I can get on, on the whole topic because I just don't, I, I feel like you guys have done a better job articulating what he might believe about things than he's done in uh, a lot of time. So I don't know, maybe we can convince him to come on and, uh, help us understand where he's coming from. Yeah, that'd be really cool if we could get him on and I really ask him about this and sort of see how he's, how he feels and where he's coming from and he can elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, speaking of figureheads, trademark Shinobi bad segue. Vitalik is, for the second time, I will remind everybody, this is not the first time he has said this, We'll leave Ethereum if the immaturity and memes continue. <laughs> and <laughs> like, uh, I just this this kid just like blows my mind. It like he he talks this huge game about like, the decentralization of everything and blockchain platforms. Well, that what comes along with that tacitly is. Um, you know, people can use it for what they want to use it for. And in my opinion, summing this up, he's pretty much uh, throwing a temper tantrum because people aren't using Ethereum for the things that he wants them to use Ethereum for, which I might add are not even practical to use it for. <laughs> and like this whole thing, it, it's, it's silly. And like it kind of ties in with a, a tweet storm that we've got in the show notes about uh, Kevin Pham discussing the kind of the, the threat of having leadership in, in a crypto system. And he, he kind of goes through like starting off with Charlie dumping all of his uh, Litecoin and then you know, Vitalik threatening to leave Ethereum. And like this, you know, you, you can obviously go through and read the, the whole thread yourself. I don't want to kind of just read it off tweet by tweet. But like the, the general gist of it is, you know, that, that is a big security threat. Like, what, what do you think would happen to the market value of Ethereum if their, their boy genius meme just said, fuck this, I'm out? Like, that this isn't working, goodbye. But I, I think it would probably crash like a rock <laughs> and, and the entire platform would just stagnate and not actually be used for it. Yeah, I really like that thread from Kevin's farm there. Like, uh, it's one of those uh, things where... You know, I mean, like uh, when I was looking at Litecoin, it's like I saw Charlie as really like, you know, hey, he brought everybody together and, you know, and activated SegWit. And, you know, I mean, like I kind of saw like, oh, maybe there's like a little bit of value to this uh, leadership role, you know, being able to bring all the players together like that. And, um, yeah, it's just like been over the course of this rest of this year that I've kind of like started to realize like, you know, as much as like as good as a a guy Charlie is, and you know, and as good as a developer as he is, like it really is still just a, a, a risk to have a leader like that. If you have a leader, I mean, let's say the thing gets big, and then somebody just comes and puts the chokehold on you and tells you to reverse the chain or something like that. I mean, I don't know. The centralized, uh, the any part of the system that is centralized, I mean, is a problem, and like a leader is a pretty clear centralized part of the system and uh yeah Vitalik dropped out i think it'd be pretty bad for ethereum it, it might be but i mean it's it's like if a scam if the leadership of a scam changes does that really affect the scam i don't know it depends on how much they spend on marketing that quarter right um there's obviously a lot of sneaky lying bastards that are making it seem like there's a lot of value to ethereum when there's absolutely none so if they were out 
you know, the main one. And I don't even know if he's, I mean, this is a 23 year old kid, right? I doubt he has been masterminding scams for, you know, the last couple decades, there's gotta be some more experienced con men in the game, I would think. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if they had him leave and then it, you know, they just, uh, they use that story to pump it even further. So, I mean, it's all, it's so many layers of stupid. I don't, I, I don't know. It's so dumb. Yeah, I mean, that that was one of the things that made me really skeptical of him being this, I think that he's called the wonderkind. It's a German word for wonder child. One of the things that made me very skeptical from the very beginning, because I assumed that because like, I would be absolutely terrified to be known as the leader of a cryptocurrency like that, like I think someone said in the thread, the, the smartest thing that Satoshi ever did was to leave accident or on purpose it was the smartest thing they could have done because that is one of bitcoin's greatest strengths and i think there was even a tweet that he mentioned there that some i think it was like meltdown and uh uh novel i don't remember his real name i just know his handle um they were they were going to rate different cryptocurrencies based on leadership as in if you had then your cryptocurrency got a higher score and I was like whoa what the hell it's like I would give I would give a, any cryptocurrency that has had like there of course there's a difference between like leadership and you know founders um but any any time where you have a very solid figure in the social sphere that you know is is looked to to make decisions or know some event uh, how to interpret an event anytime you have that kind of situation like that's very dangerous just from a social perspective if not a technical uh, with the, you know the foundation and everything um in terms of because one of the things you have to uh, you have to account for is funding like it doesn't matter how how decentralized your development team is um in terms of like the number of people in it if they're all getting their funding from similar sources then that can be a huge problem um because that influences their developmental decisions i've been skeptical of vitalik just from the perspective of the fact that he's always been called the founder of ethereum and that he's a very public person um that's just always made me very scared of what's going to happen to ethereum in the future i don't know if ethereum would die if vitalik left but um it would certainly be a major hit because there's so much, you know, I wouldn't, I don't know, I've, I haven't really gotten into the Ethereum crowd before. I don't know if there's like a cult of personality around him. I don't know if I'd call it a cult, but <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's um, and, I haven't seen. We're, we're going to talk about the other, the other kidnapping story later, but, um, but yeah, I mean, does anybody have any doubt that just to illustrate the security vulnerability that you're kind of alluding to that somebody couldn't, um, couldn't essentially short Ethereum and then go pick up Vitalik and hold them for a couple of weeks and make a ton of money, right? I mean, this is not a yeah, I'm... <laughs> not how smart people set up uh, stuff like this, right? There's there's a reason that Satoshi was anonymous and bolted, um, and there's a reason that that Vitalik and Charlie Lee didn't feel any need to because they knew they weren't going to build anything that was worth fighting over, right? Now it's worth a lot more money, I'm sure, than they ever imagined. There's probably far more suckers out there than they were counting on. And, uh, you know, at least Charlie Lee is like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decrease my kidnap value a little bit and uh, sell off all my light going. So I, I don't know how you yeah. deal with that. Uh, but, yeah, it's definitely a security issue. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how public most of it is, but let's say there was definitely a uh, funding and uh, or funder related issue when uh, Ethereum had their major hard fork last year. That was a major motivator in the decision to hard fork. Um, so that is, def I would definitely consider that a vulnerability. And you know, the fact that I don't really know what Vitalik is taking issue with because. He's, you know, he said things like he he thinks Bitcoin Cash was because it's a thing that Zuko and Vitalik have said is that Bitcoin Cash was they call it the liberal fork. They they, they were the reasonable ones. <laughs> and they are I think Zuko called them refugees from Bitcoin. They called Bitcoin Cash refugees from Bitcoin. I was like, whoa, <laughs> you, you are going a bit farther. So I don't I don't exactly 
like if I could actually, if Vitalik is just upset about, you know, the social stuff where it's like constant bickering and everything, I can understand that, but I don't really sympathize with the concerns that he has with Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general. Like I don't, if it's memes, it's like really you're going, if you can get taken down by memes, then you have, you have a bigger problem <laughs> than, um, I mean, it's like, I'm sorry, I don't like, I mean, because I mean, I do feel bad, kind of bad for him in a way, because even the times that we've talked about, like uh, Fatalic, Fit Fatalic, and all that, like, I I try to stay away from like, I don't I don't like you know making fun of people in those ways, and he probably gets a lot of that already, but you know, it's it's meant to be you know humorous, and you know maybe he, I don't know, he just doesn't he doesn't appreciate that aspect of Bitcoin that, you know, people like, this is a, a highly, you know, um, <laughs> this is a lot of talking about this Vitalik. It's, it's finally getting to him. He's like, gosh, I'm going to have to, I don't you know. know. I don't know if it was that one, but you know, there's, there's definitely been years of jokes about, you know, his appearance and all that. So I don't know if maybe that's gotten to him or maybe just the fact that Ethereum has gotten so big now. And maybe one of the reasons he wants to leave is because he can't, he doesn't feel he can make the decisions that he's being asked to make anymore. I mean, it well, could I mean, be that. I don't good, think it's Any means. good con man knows to get out before, before everybody else, right? And... I gotta say, it's been more and more obvious. It's it's been laughable over the last six months. Like it's just so stupid. There's there's nobody that could possibly still think that that network is secure or that it has any any value that has any idea what they're doing. Right? I mean, it is an absolute joke. Um, I think it's even more obvious. Like they had a better story than Litecoin, because Litecoin like forked and changed like two stupid things. At least they had a better narrative, but that narrative has completely been destroyed over the last six months. So I got to think that has more to do with it than, uh, than you know. Than, although I got to say, the one of the one of the podcasts I was listening to said that um, it was Tales from the Crypt. They said Vitalik or Vitalik. I'm saying Vitalik now. Um, that it could be his hol his Halloween costume because he wouldn't have to do hardly anything to be the you know the guy that comes out of the coffin at the beginning of Tales from the Crypt. So that that's pretty harsh. That actually made me feel a little little sad. But um, and I'm I'm more than happy to make fun of him otherwise. But but all that said, I think that probably all of the hacks, like the hundred million dollars here, the sixty million dollars there. That's probably you know more significant, um, and the fact there's absolutely not a use case on the planet right now that anybody can come up with for this thing, other than Crypto Kitties, which totally destroys it and should be in a database anyway because it gets absolutely no utility from running on Ethereum. Like that's that's the best they've come up with. I got to think that's a hey. bigger factor. Hey, they can they can always say that it was the first cryptocurrency to get into the U.S. National Archives. <laughs> If, they, if that uh, donation from WikiLeaks goes through, but yeah, yeah I do. I much. definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do. Like the reason I'm not really sympathetic to the fact that he feels like he wants to leave or is at least threatening to leave is that you know he has to acknowledge he has a huge amount of responsibility in the way that things have turned out with Ethereum, like. Like if you don't, because he tweets about all the time, like we don't, we don't deserve the price increases. We don't deserve where Bitcoin or Ethereum has gotten because we're not helping refugees enough. And it's like, well, dude, you're the one going to Russia and talking to Vladimir Putin and making, you know, this foundation that has alliances with all of the major institutional players that we were all trying to get away from in the first place, like Microsoft. Why are you partnering with Microsoft? <laughs> Do you see well, Bitcoin like developers? Number, right? Like, uh, you guys are not spending enough of your money on problems that I care about. I'm not spending my money on that shit, but, but I'm going to throw a fit because you're not. That, that's, I guess, yeah, I mean, so, you know, so, I was just saying that's the social justice warrior mentality, right? <laughs> you guys are not spending enough of your money on my problems or problems that I care about. Yeah, I mean, he, he, you know, he, he, he's the founder, he's the creator of if he, if he thinks that, you know, this stuff has turned into a monster, then he has to account for, you know, what was his role in that? What did he overlook? What, what kinds of trade offs did he make that maybe he should have taken more time considering and not mocked? constantly mocking Bitcoin for being too conservative or too slow to make changes um, when you end up 
uh, with his system, which seems to be on a move fast, break things basis. And he shouldn't be, he shouldn't mock people because they made different decisions and those decisions actually ended up putting Bitcoin in a lot better place after nine years than Ethereum is in just two years, two or three years. Yeah, I mean, like, I think you guys did a good job breaking down the rock, but I think you're kind of, like, ignoring the hard place because, <clears throat> it's like, yeah, he has all this responsibility. He's, like, made a lot of the design decisions that led Ethereum to where it is now. But, like, th that entire community is just a cult of personality. Like, people are in Ethereum because my boy genius is going to solve all the problems and fix all the things and, and make me rich, and, and this can be used for everything. And, like, he, he's, he's stuck in that now. Like, he, he's wedged himself in that spot where he is not only responsible, but he is the basis by which investors are actually making these decisions. So, I mean, like, he, he's got – he can't just walk away. He has to find a reason to walk away that is socially sellable because it will have that negative effect. Like if Vitalik just washes his hands of Ethereum and you have these, this mob of investors that is only invested because my boy genius is going to fix all the problems, like it will destroy that entire project. And I mean, look at what he has been doing over like the past year, making deals with all kinds of major banks out there, like JP Morgan, uh, Santander or whoever was, um, starting to look into like fiat tokens on Ethereum, literally signed a deal with the Bank of Russia. Like he's just been selling this bullshit to the exact wrong crowd of people to be selling bullshit to. On top of like just being in this position where the only reason it has the market capitalization it has is those people and the, the fanboys following the boy genius. And so, like, they, they, like, he's just fucked. Like, there's no way out of this situation without getting smashed from one of those sides. Yeah, and speaking of the price briefly, I actually didn't even know that Ethereum went up above $700. That's pretty sad considering that it lost its number two place to Ripple. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was like, wow, the Ethereum price must have gone down. And then I just checked it. It's like, oh, wait, it went above $700 and it's still like that's a, that. Oh, my God. It took Bitcoin how many years to get above $700? <laughs> they got it within two, two, three years. Like how? how uh, it's, it's just how is that not that like a major is, celebration point yeah the dumb money that's pouring off of bitcoin has to land somewhere i mean i don't I, what's going on with one coin i haven't thought about that in a while but that was doing pretty well and it's like all these other scams right it's got like the caricature front person right she was like the blood drinking russian or something right vitalik's like the uh the super boy genius like they're all they're all such spice girls right um if if you if you don't know anything about the technology just look at the the person that's pushing the scam and try to ask yourself is this like a person or is this like a cartoon drawing of a person that a pr person put together <laughs> and if if it's the latter don't buy it well one of the th things that i thought was really funny um because zuko mentioned it but zuko gave a talk at ccc um, I believe that was actually just yesterday or the day before that. Um, and one of the things that he showed on his very few slides was a uh, coin market cap of different cryptocurrencies. And it was so BitConnect be ahead of Zcash on that list. I was like, it's like, oh, you're the CEO of this company doing this cryptocurrency. And then you show a map and it's like, oh, the Ponzi scheme is ahead of your coin. Coin. that's pretty sad <laughs> because then he has the gall this it was just such a despicable line during um i think it was like the first third of his talk where he says now i don't like i don't like to shit talk other coins but and then he goes on this long string of think monero's privacy is not good enough the security and all these things he didn't offer any evidence whatsoever no specifics he just completely ripped on monero for no reason when he was just going all high horse with i don't shit talk other coins and it's like oh my god zuko you're becoming another vitalik like 
uh, I was so hopeful for Zcash in the beginning. Then I, when I heard about the trusted setup, I was like, mm, okay, let's see. Let's, this is, you know, let's experiment with this. Let's see where it goes. I don't really like this though. Um, but then, yeah, I, I've lost interest in Zcash with the way it's turned out. And that's really disappointing. Yeah, I love when people go like, I, I don't usually do this, but that makes it okay that I'm totally going to do this after I said that. Right. That's, yeah, that, uh, I, in that uh, thread from uh, Luke over there, like with the leadership thread, like he mentioned Zoku and Zcash and, um, you know, I mean, yeah, it's just uh, that's that whole thing. Yeah, it was pretty upsetting to see, like, I don't know. You're right. It's like ridiculous. You, you're giving this speech and like, I mean, it was kind of, I don't know. So Kusa character. He had like these slides where it just looked like scribbled pieces of paper and he knew he was going to remember it when he got up there and, and it didn't, it obviously didn't remember it. And I, I don't know. It definitely was a, I don't know. It's kind of aggravating to watch really. But, um, you know, I'd like to, I don't know. I'd like to hear what he has to say about like, you know, Maybe something where he would like to actually bring up the technicals of Monero and how ZK Snarks could be better than this and that, but but it, it was none of that. There was none of that. Oh, well, uh, that's kind of one of the problems because if you want to know how ZK Snarks work, basically you can't go to any talk from <laughs> uh, uh, by a person from Zcash because every time someone asks, "Can you explain how ZK Snarks work?" even if they have like they did last year, they had ZK Snarks for the interested layperson in the title of the. No, no one asked him. He said at the very beginning of his talk before he even started, the guy said that he could not explain how ZK Snarks work. And it's like, well, why is it in the title, buddy? And Zuko, um, I believe this time he did slightly better at this recent talk. He, uh, he gave a metaphor involving colored billiard balls or something to a blind person, which the metaphor, I think, was reasonably okay. But once again, it was about zero knowledge proofs. It wasn't about ZK Snarks. So this is now at least the second occasion where he's been asked to explain how ZK Snarks work, and he hasn't been able to do that, which is fine. You know, if he's a CEO, CEOs, you know, generally, I, I mean, I personally, if I was the CEO of the company running Zcash, I would put in so much effort into getting into all the math and cryptography about how CK snarks work so that I could at least explain it on a rudimentary level from a mathematical perspective. But, you know, CEOs don't have to know that stuff. What you do in that case, if your CEO is not knowledgeable, is that you bring along a person who wrote all of the technical tutorials that finally came out after several months of people asking, you bring that person on the stage with you so that they can answer the question and give people that answer. Like, there's no reason to bring someone to talk to three, like, I think there was 3,000 people in that hall. There's no reason to give a talk. Now, specifically, the talk wasn't specifically on Zcash. But, you know, everyone knows that he's going to get asked that question. So the smart thing is to bring along someone who can answer that question. And I don't know why they haven't done that. It's just very strange. The worst part is it, it's not impossible. It's just long-winded, right? Like, it can be done. Like, it just takes a while. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious as well. Mm -hmm, but keeping with the themes of uh, central uh, points of failure, though, like JW mentioned, <laughs> I'm sure all of you... Uh, saw that the uh, EXMO CEO was kidnapped. And I I'm glad to say, um, you know, since Thursday when we put this on the doc, uh, he's actually been returned after a $1 million uh, ransom paid in Bitcoin. But, you know, it kind of wind back to like the whole like uh, tweet thread that really, I guess, is the thematic connection to this group of stories. Like th this is, like a serious issue, not just for like the leader of a project, not just for the CEO of some company out there, but anybody who, who is publicly known to have any sizable amount of crypto or even just how much they own, no, because you don't know what that's going to be worth in the future. Like that is a big personal security risk. And, you know, I'd, I know a lot of people probably have that thought pop into their head and then just just dismiss it. Like, that's something out of a movie. Like, I, I won't ever have to worry about some issue like that. But that that's really something that people in this space, like anybody in this space right now, should really think about seriously. 
I mean, like we, none of us know where this is going or how far this is going or what's going to happen along the way. I mean, it, like we, if we look at like the, the trajectory that the, the U.S. seems to be on along with a bunch of other countries, which uh, we'll, we'll touch on in a little bit, like there is a huge trend towards KYC, towards IDing everybody. And sure, everybody doesn't have to be explained in depth how big of a fucking problem it is to have your personal information tied to things like how much cryptocurrency you deposited to this exchange or how much cryptocurrency you withdrew from this exchange and the ability to actually track and correlate things like that. Like somebody could look at that having a piece of information from a database breach and I, I could probably figure out whether you actually withdrew that to a personal wallet or another exchange. Go look on the blockchain and see, hey, did that filter off to like a known, like after a few hops, did, did that go to something that is suspiciously large traffic that you're conducting like back and forth with that exchange? And like these things are going to happen. Like I, I really think like the, the more I've looked at where government regulation is going over the past month or so, it's going to take somebody actually being hurt or killed or kidnapped information that governments force entities to collect on people before they really step back and realize like what they're doing creating that kind of regulation like they literally are in the long term a situation that puts people's personal safety at risk and i don't think they're going to take it seriously it really happens well, I mean, in all fairness, that's the intention of these laws, right? They're they're trying to put you in a position where they can take your stuff. They're not all that concerned if another criminal decides that they're going to get in there first, right? The the point is they want their chunk of twenty five or whatever percent uh, capital gains that you get, and uh, that's the priority for any mafias. Their take, not necessarily your well being. Um, so that that shouldn't be super surprising. Um, but you know the the thing that I would say as somebody that's been in security and has dealt with physical security stuff for a long time is that if you do have a lot of Bitcoin, um, or if you especially if you have Bitcoin, just really briefly, if you have money in a bank, let's say that you have a million dollars cash in a bank and somebody kidnaps you, it's not easy to get that money, right? They can't just like put a gun in your ribs and walk into the bank and then walk out with you in a duffel bag full of a million dollars. The, the bank down the street, they maybe have ten or $15,000 like your local branch at any given time. Um, that would be typical. They don't have a ton of money just sitting around of like cash, right? So, you know, this is, this is kind of dark, but if you, if you were doing something like that, you would have to, you'd have to kidnap somebody and hold them for a long period of time, right? And they would have to go into the bank on a regular basis, maybe every week, call ahead, schedule a pickup um, and do that for a long period of time, maybe months in order to get a million dollars in cash. And you can bet your ass that the FBI is going to be sniffing around there when you've made your fifth pickup of more than $10,000, right? Because every time that you get more than $10,000 in cash, a report is filed. So as shitty as the old legacy system is, it actually makes it kind of hard because it's hard to make payments to kidnap somebody and extort them. And Bitcoin's not like that, right? If if you have a million dollars in Bitcoin, somebody can take all of your money in 10 minutes, right? And then leave you in a ditch. So your risk profile for holding Bitcoin goes, and I, I do have some of this stuff in the threat model actually, but your risk profile as a Bitcoin holder is way higher than somebody that's holding cash or real estate. And uh, and that, that needs to be understood. Um, the other thing that that a lot because a lot of people have money for the first time and they haven't had it before is that it's just like house maintenance you need to spend a certain amount of money on security if you have a million dollars you should probably be spending somewhere between 20 and eighty thousand dollars a year on your personal security that's either staff training you know jameson lop is always posting pictures of handguns and rifles and stuff those are reasonable things to do for personal security. And all of the guys that have been gold bugs for a long time, like they've, they've already been living through this to some degree. Cause you could, you know, you can grab a brick of gold and walk out and have $80,000 or something. But, um, but for a lot of the, a lot of the crypto folks, this is, this is new 
um, it's new money and you, you probably need to hire somebody that, uh, that can really help you think through these things and, uh, then make sure you're doing the right thing. And th the last thing that I'll mention really briefly is that one of the things that you can do to make sure that you've got the right sort of security profile is reduce the amount of reward that somebody gets for getting a hold of you. You can, you can spend more on security. You can increase the cost of them attacking you. And you can also reduce the reward that they'll get. So you can do stuff like, you know, um, uh, multi-sig wallets so that they would have to kidnap multiple people in order to get the money. Um, but you can also do stuff simple, like just don't have as much, right? If you had like a million bucks in crypto at the beginning of the year, and now it's 10 million, as much as I want you to, to hold for the sake of the revolution um, and for the good that it's going to do uh, to, to get us switched off of fiat, it, for you personally, that might be a really, really dangerous idea. Um, so, you know, those are all the things that you got to think through. Hey, uh, JW, just a quick question back at you from this. Um, is Do you think there's a possibility that the guy that did do this kidnapping, if he received Bitcoin, like that the FinCEN work on that could lead to his capture? It's possible, but I wouldn't bet on it. Um, I mean, yeah, so the fungibility of Bitcoin, right, the traceability, I guess, would be another way to say it, is questionable. But um, I don't know, man, if I had to bet, I would bet it was an inside. I don't know anything about this guy, right? It's kind of a it's kind of a jerk thing to say to somebody that could be the victim of a crime. But from what I can tell, just being super on the outside, it, it sounds like more of an inside job, right? It sounds like a good way to extort some money out of business partners or, you know, the existing company. So that, that would be my guess. Um, uh, but you know, that's total speculation, right? Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's possible, but I think it's pretty hard and I don't, I don't think that, um, if I was a criminal, I would rather have Bitcoin than hundred dollar bills that may or may not be marked and almost certainly have all their serial numbers written down. Right. Because that's the other thing that if you try to go get a million dollars in hundred dollar bills, if somehow you were able to convince them to do it. You can bet your ass every one of those hundred dollar bills is going to be scanned and those serial numbers are going to be written down and when you go to try to buy a pack of cigarettes you know there, there's a chance that's going to come up as flagged counterfeit or whatever so you know um there there's there's a lot there's a lot of systems in place that we need before this is a safe sort of uh sort of experience for everybody right at some point in the future you'll be able to buy insurance and if somebody kidnaps you and takes your cryptocurrency they'll wake up dead right but we're not we're not in that world right now and uh you can't buy that insurance you you can't um the, the market hasn't prov provided free market solutions to the risk that a lot of people have woken up with uh, based on a really really good year um and you're on your own to think that stuff through to uh, to a, a higher degree than probably anybody else in history has ever had to be on their own, right? Um, so that's you got to take it seriously, and it's definitely worth hiring somebody to help you think it through. Yeah, I mean, I would hope that you know that something that, like he would get arrested over this, like just because I don't know, it would show like a good example of kind of like the you know, community monitoring like their own sort of deal. But I mean, like it very well could be like an inside job or, or something like that. And um, yeah, I think the risk is really there. And I mean, like uh, before we had heard that he had gotten out on re release from this ransom, like I was talking about how it'd be terrifying to be in that situation because you just, you know, you'd hate to fathom that, you know, there is really sick people in the world that will sit there cutting off your fingers, you know, asking if you want your last one or not. And, you know, they don't really care if they get the money or not. It's really kind of like they hope they get the money. That's, you know, it's a, it's a sick world out there. And, you know, I mean, yeah, just definitely need to be aware of like what's going on around you and, you know, all that sort of stuff and, you know, try and keep your, uh, your uh, risk low. Like you're saying, like, I mean, you know, just and it, it is kind of surprising how rarely this stuff happens, right? I mean, with all of the challenges of getting your hands on cash and all that sort of thing, there's not a whole lot of people that actually suffer this. Like, you know, there, uh, you look at like some really wealthy guys like billionaires that still drive by themselves with no security guards, right? Um, so I, I guess I want to put it in context a little bit. That's part of the reason I feel like it's an inside job. It wasn't actually enough money to be worth it um, in a lot of ways. Uh, but, uh, 
but it's it's still so i don't want to i don't want everybody i'm not trying to like be a fear monger and make everybody panic i'm trying to say take the take the approach that you take to your house right you set two or three percent aside per year maybe five percent aside per year if it's an older house to just keep the maintenance up if you if you have a significant amount of money now um, and i would say you know anything over two hundred thousand dollars net worth you know liquid cash is a significant amount of money there's certain things that you need to spend money on to uh to make sure that you're just not a soft target right and and that's all relative um but it's it's worth doing you know at the, at the very least i would say the, the cheapest thing that you could do is you could at least have a dog you could at least have a handgun and you could at least go through a couple weeks of firearms training and know how to use a handgun and if you've got you know a couple hundred thousand dollars that's probably enough to make it not worth it for the attacker yeah, that's a good call. A little bit of training and uh, some safety precautions can go a long way when people are starting to think about whether or not to take you down. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh -oh. You know, drop, drop that because I thought Janine was going to say something and we lost her. I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, like uh, I've been thinking about getting that little bit of protection just because, you know, I mean, like you're saying, just a little bit goes a long way. You free to talk? The GCHQ still got you, Janine? Yeah, the con I don't know how glitchy it is on my end. The connection's a bit glitchy uh, for you guys, but um, yeah. Here, because I change rooms. Yeah, it sounds all right. Yeah, it sounds. Um, the only thing I was going to say is I agree with all that stuff about. Um, I definitely think that the risk is amplified when you have Bitcoin. And I would say that the risk is even more amplified. Um, at least the risk is amplified a different way when, because like I've said this before, but if every single cryptocurrency exchange was to go down tomorrow, I'd be fine. I'd have every single Bitcoin that I own or control. I could say I control all that. Um, when you have a situation where you have your funds in a custodial account, like that's why I think custodial exchanges are some of the biggest risks because it adds so much more uncertainty in terms of the fact, like, can you imagine, like you have to assume that the exchange is trustworthy, but even if the exchange itself is trustworthy and all of its employees are trustworthy, what happens if one of the exchanges employees, what happens if of, of, of an exchange gets kidnapped like there's so many people now involved in your that you probably like like even if the employee uh, himself or herself has really great opsec if their family family member fails they could be used as a means of or taking advantage of that change and then you know so it just adds so much more risk and I I would I would hate to be I would hate to be like a very um, a person that was high up in the management of any custodial exchange because like it just there's like centralized exchanges because it's not only safe exchange it's safe for the people operating it because the worst that they can do is you know whatever a Bitcoin developer can do like if a Bitcoin developer gets kidnapped the worst they can do is it changes to the next software release and then but that'll get flagged by all the other developers so when you have a decentralized exchange situation um whereas with a custodial exchange you can get away with a lot more stuff that most people won't notice as we have seen a number of times with some exchanges um totally. so, i would know, not I, want to be a whale right now at exmo right because maybe it was a million dollars and your username and password so I can see everybody else that has a significant holding in your yeah. centralized exchange. I wouldn't want to be a Bitcoin whale in general and have a significant amount of my Bitcoin in any exchange because like it would be it like if people think it's stressful to worry about about whether they've like securely stored their Bitcoin, I would I would be stressed out of my mind every single day, wondering what is going on with my money or what you know the money that I because give money to these exchanges, it's very similar to it's like 
very, very few steps away from being a bank where when you give money to a bank, you're basically loaning it to them and they can do whatever they want with the actual money that you give to them. Um, all you basically have is a receipt saying, this is the amount that you can possibly withdraw at some point in the future, but you may not get all of that money. Uh, we never know because as, as we found out with some exchanges, not all of their reserves are in supreme condition and that can cause problems. So I, I would, I, I would consider any, anyone who runs a cryptocurrency exchange to be at the top of the list in terms of people that are at risk of getting kidnapped or having their relatives kidnapped. Like I would not want to be a public person at one of these exchanges. Yeah, I think you're right. Like, good news is we got this decentralized exchanges coming on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's and just if, and if, yeah, and if you are a CEO of an exchange and you haven't, like, I can understand, like, like a, you know, a, a not knowing that they have to, you know, plan out how to or use some of it for saying GW to, like, to make you know just your personal care if you're a if you're a person running an exchange and you haven't done that stuff like i and if you because like some of these people are going to amount of money and if you haven't some of that money to do some of that security stuff like i don't feel sorry for you like if something happens sorry for your family and your friends sorry for you like this is just basic yeah, stuff. Coming, like most of the people through, running yeah. exchanges, they're not, most of these people running exchanges, they've been in the financial industry, like gonna put it out of the game. They know how this works. They know the consequences that comes with, they don't think that, if they, if they don't think that, that applies to cryptocurrency, you no, know, really bad. Yeah, yeah, your connection is bad, but uh, yeah, no, I'll just recap what you were saying real quick. I think you were saying um, that a lot of these people, they, they've they been in the financial industry, they know what it's like to have money, and they have already hired um, probably security consultants, or their company has hired security consultants, but if they haven't, that's really stupid. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if you're <laughs> if you're a high tech person and you're just you know everything's going well, uh, just put that on your your top to do list to make sure that you get a hold of one of these firms that'll help you think through those problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really like you know, it's people need to think about security, like especially those who are responsible for other people's things. And I mean, it just kind of comes with uh, the territory. I mean. But uh, Shinobi segue out of nowhere, which isn't really a segue. <laughs> I hope that by now everybody watching has actually read through this. If not, you should. Uh, obviously, one of the biggest problems over the, the second half of this year, technically speaking, is just the complete abysmal coordination for the SegWit adoption. I mean, like we've had blockchain info who claimed that they were ready to roll it out back in February, not doing anything, um, still not out. Coinbase is dragging their feet. Uh, a lot of the big exchanges are dragging their feet. What, what the hell? Like this, this should not have been a surprise to anybody, something that anybody was unprepared for. And yet a lot of people are is calling for like a lot more coordination we're, go we're going to the fucking moon right now and people are flooding into this space we need to get a lot better at coordinating and actually upgrading like software integrating new features as they're brought online all they're really doing is screwing their customers up and like, it's, it, this is something we really need to fucking think about going forward. Yeah, I think uh, I was a great blog when I read it. Like, um, you know, I was really kind of like feeling it because, you know, I've been like uh, put working to 
put this meetup together and everything. And I really agree with him. And it's just like, you know, we, we've got these uh, availability, this option to scale, but it is going to take some great coordination. And, um, you know, that uh, it's going to take some effort. It's just not going to happen. And, um, you know, definitely uh, hope that, you know, we can come together in 2018 and, and scale properly and, you know, with grace and not like, uh, you know, I mean, the past years it's been, it's just open source, you know, it's, it's a rough ride open for everyone to see. So it would be good to see a little bit of coordination and coming together to make sure that the network uh, can run smoothly and onboard all these new users next year. Yeah, I mean, to kind of pick up the pace a little bit, <laughs> we're getting close to like three hours almost. Um, two things I kind of want to touch on was two big businesses in the space. Um, sadly, I, I can't show you the tweet I'm going to mention because um, Brian Armstrong blocked me a long time ago. But in, in the, the tweet thread, uh, we were discussing a little while back with their uh, UTXO problem. Brian actually responded to that after a delay of a few days with a statement, I believe, um, yes, we do have a lot of work to do condensing um, unspent outputs. And as something that popped up on Reddit, I think, late yesterday, a lot of the things um, people, people were pretty much urging everyone to get off of Coinbase and, and offering lots of advice on how to do that efficiently. And one of the tricks people were mentioning is that you can transfer your balances from Coinbase to GDAX instantly if you have an account on both. And unlike Coinbase, GDAX does not charge for withdrawal fees. And at some point, um, I think in the last day or so, I think Coinbase has disabled transfers from Coinbase to GDAX. And the error message people are getting is unsupported currency, which like, it seems to me like they, they tried to not acknowledge the problem. Brian kind of downplayed the, the severity of it in, in his kind of business tone. And now they're just scrambling to like shut down where they're hemorrhaging money. Like no, no more like people just switching to GDAX and withdrawing there for free. Like it, and the, the whole tone of the situation to me just screams like this is an actual serious problem. This, this is not just a tiny portion of their addresses or their holdings because like wh why would they respond this way? Like it'd be like, no, here's the, the few addresses this is an issue for. We'll deal with it. Like it's not that big of an issue. They wouldn't be shutting down the ability to move coins from Coinbase to GDAX with no explanation, when we all know that's, that's what people were doing to not pay the ridiculous withdrawal fees. And it just seems like the, the whole house is on fire and they're just trying to hide it from everybody. And then to, to kind of push on uh, to a, a, a brother company, I guess I would say, Nicholas Doria is actually uh, following through with his fork of uh, the Bitcoin stack a while back and is actually now releasing a whole open source payment system to pretty much replicate BitPay. And you know, we I think we've touched on this before, but like these are two of the big companies in like the space that were just backing the NYA, pushing for this like big block like at all cost nonsense. And yeah, one of them is burning to the ground right now because of their technical incompetence. And I think over the next year, we're going to see demonstrated pretty convincingly that the other one's business model is effectively just selling your Bitcoin to cash for you because absolutely everything else can be just done with free open source software. Like you don't need to pay BitPay for their services just to accept Bitcoin. And like that, I think, is really just going to rock the business ecosystem and kind of show like you guys don't steer the cart here. Yeah. No input. No, I was just going to say like, you know, that, that BTC pay thing, I literally like, uh, I like that idea, you know, to try and, uh, you know, get merchants to be able to accept Bitcoin and, uh, be able to accept like whatever kind of crypto they really want the open source part of it. I think that this is going to be, uh, an awesome thing to see like with the decentralized exchanges and you know this sort of thing coming on it just like i really like this is where i start just i start to see yeah like the community 
it's like the pieces are there. We really do need to just come together to put it together and make it work right. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to kind of uh, jump past uh, the last uh, chunk of stories. I mean, really, the only one I can say that stuck out is not pretty old at this point with uh, pushing off the last show. It's uh, Poloniex going KYC only. But, uh, you know, I, I would encourage everybody to kind of look into, like, all the links for that stuff in the, the show notes. It's, it's really kind of just continuing this wave of regulations all over the place pretty much slapping the whole KYC problem that we thought we'd escaped back on to this new system. And it's, it's not something people should just shrug off and, and act like it's not going to cause any problems. I mean, I know this has been a kind of a long one, but I, I don't know. Anybody got any last thoughts to throw in? Uh, be ready for 2018. Happy new year, everybody. Yep. Yep. Great year. Hopefully next year will be as good. And uh, yeah, get off Coinbase. Use uh, use BISC. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'll slap a little uh, last minute graphic up, everybody. Um, as usual, you can like and subscribe if you want to. Um, otherwise, you're not forced to. But have a nice day, everybody. And Janine, can slip in your last word real quick if you want. I was going to say, my New Year's resolution is to be your own thought leader. <laughs> so that I've been telling people for the past year, and I hope. Uh oh. oh man, that was going to be that last sentence was going to change all of our lives, and we missed it because the internet sucks. And I'll try again. <laughs> I was, I've been telling people for the past year to be your own thought leader. I hope they actually do it. All right. yes. On that note, Yay. <laughs> toots everybody. Peace.